So, I'm sure if you're here, you already know what I'm going to be talking about. Undertale and Deltarune have treasure troves of secrets that are still being uncovered to this day, and I've covered this before in another video. If you haven't seen it yet, look in the description. It'll be the first link you see. It will give loads of context for this video. Oh yeah, uh, about the new iceberg. Well, remember the one I was talking about before? Yeah, fuck it, we've got a new one. This is the ultimate Undertale and Deltarune Iceberg, which compiles info from both icebergs, including some new entries. It'll be linked in the description. I'll be skipping over any entries I've covered before, so it will be entirely new ground I'm covering. This iceberg was once again made by Reddit user Cheese Seatbelt, who has helped a fuck ton with writing this script, so massive shoutouts to him. And thank you so much for helping me with this video, man. His channel, Notorious Rob, will be linked in the description. Speaking of the description, uh, you'll find a Google Doc in the description of all of the sources for the information found within this video. Be sure to check that out, as lots of other people's research and discoveries were compiled for this video, and I just want to give credit where credit is due. Now, let's not waste any more time. Let's take a deep dive and explore the iceberg together, shall we? Song that might play when you fight Sans. This is probably the most well-known secret in all of Undertale. Which doesn't really make it a secret now, does it? The song that might play when you fight Sans is an unused track that, for all intents and purposes, is a song that may or may not play when you fight Sans. This song is not in the game files, it's only included in soundtrack releases. This track was most likely made to troll players into thinking that Sans is fightable in other routes other than genocide. Jevil Fight Jevil is Deltarune's secret boss you can access after obtaining all three pieces of a broken key and then going to the lowest level of Card Castle to face him. The fight is famous, or infamous, for being the hardest fight so far in Deltarune, and the mystery surrounding him is comparable to Gaster, due to how much we simply don't know about him. Soulless Pacifist Ending the Soulless Pacifist ending is a secret ending activated by completing a genocide route and then a true pacifist route. If you remember, after completing the pacifist route fully, you're given the choice to live with Toriel or leave on your own. If you choose to go with Toriel, you're treated to the same cutscene of Toriel walking into Frisk's room. However, after Toriel walks out, Shara possesses Frisk and flashes an eerie smile as the screen cuts to black and a slow, creepy laugh is heard. If you decide to leave on your own, the picture of Frisk and all of their friends is replaced with Chara standing in the middle, with all the faces around them crossed out. Survey Program Survey Program is the file name for Deltarune. With the reveal of the game on Twitter saying this game was part of a survey, this name makes sense. As a side note, I renamed the file on my computer for Deltarune as Undertale 2. And every time I forget I named it that, it just seems so normal to me now. The River Person The River Person is an enigmatic hooded boatsman who transports the player to various locations in Undertale. They have a lot of strange things to say to you on the way to these locations, some of which don't have any meaning at all, such as tra-la-la, eat a mushroom every day. Why? Then I know you're listening to me but some seem to hold more meaning, such as hinting that Asgore can be weakened by eating pie by saying, Tra-la-la, I heard Asgore has a favorite food, to even possibly alluding to the hidden sound test in Snowden. Tra-la-la, did you ever hear the old song coming from the sea? There's also the famous line from the river person that hints at Gaster. Tra-la-la, beware of the man who speaks in hands. The Knight. The Knight is a Deltarune character shrouded in mystery. The only thing we know about them is that they took control of the Spade King and locked the other three kings away in the castle. The Spade King regards him as if he's a higher authority than him, so he holds a lot of power in the Dark World. The identity of the Knight is not shown as of Chapter 1, but many theories about his identity are far and wide. Your choices don't matter. Your choices don't matter is a major theme in Deltarune. When doing just about anything in the game, the result is the same. Even when attempting to do genocide like in Undertale, 
nothing really different happens. You don't gain XP, and the enemies just run away. They don't die. Ralzai insists the opposite, however, that her choices do matter. This is a very stark contrast to Undertale, which is a game full of choices and decisions. It's possible that our expectations will be subverted and our choices really do matter in the end, but we'll have to wait and see. The Shelter The Shelter is a hidden area in Deltarune's town, which is highly thought to be linked to Gaster. Muse underscore Smile softly plays by The Shelter, which is a song linked to Gaster. There's nothing you can do to open the shelter, but it's likely we'll get to see the inside in later chapters of Deltarune. Murder Dance The Murder Dance is the name given to the optimal movement you can do in the genocide route to get encounters super quickly. This has become an in-joke in the community, and you know what? I vibe with it. I'm gonna murder dance all day today. That's what we call self-care. Megalo Strike Back Megalo Strike Back is a song composed by Toby Fox in 2012 for an Earthbound fan album titled I Miss You. It gained significant popularity in the Undertale fandom, being used as an almost canon but not canon enough song. It's been associated with many characters over the years like Papyrus, but the most popular of them all is Chara. The Egg the egg is a secret key item, or easter egg in this case, <laughs> you can get from an unseen man in a hidden room in the forest that you have a 2% chance of encountering. Its only use is that you can put it in Asgore's fridge. That's it. It's highly likely that the person who gives you this egg is Gaster, which has led to a lot of memes associated with Gaster and this egg. Ralzai is a girl? In 2018, YouTuber Tresicle uploaded a video talking about a theory that Ralzai is a girl. Yeah, this theory's bad. I'm not going to go after Tresicle personally for it, but this theory is just really stupid. The basis of the theory is that Ralzai is not Azriel, therefore, he's a girl. You could make the argument that Ralzai is not Azriel, even if I don't entirely agree with that, but somehow him being feminine means he's a girl? A guy can be feminine, dude. If Susie can be a tomboy, I'm certain that Ralzai can be a feminine boy. I wanted to put this entry here because there's too much of a common misconception that Ralzai is a girl or something when, no, he's just a feminine guy. Boys can be feminine. And considering the fact our expectations are being subverted a lot in Deltarune, a girl being masculine and a boy being feminine works perfectly with that idea character trapped in the code. Within the files of Deltarune, several unused strings of text can be found, suggesting that an unknown character is trapped in the code. The text reads as follows. Where... where am I? Hello? Anyone? Is... is anybody out there? Someone? Anyone? Can anyone hear me? It's dark. It's so dark here. Someone, anyone, if you can hear me, say something, please. But Nobody Came sped up. If you speed up the song But Nobody Came by 1200%, you will hear a small snippet of Your Best Friend. Once again, Toby is proving to us that he only wrote about five songs for this game. The Angel. The Angel, in Undertale, is a prophecy about how the underground will go empty with the return of an angel from the surface. Many people link this prophecy to true pacifist and genocide route, where an angel from the surface empties the underground. However, neither of these routes totally line up with the prophecy, but I'll touch on that later. The Angel is Noel. The upcoming Chapter 2 screenshots show Noel donning an angel outfit, complete with wings. This seemingly implies that she has connections to the angel from the prophecy, but it could also just be a reference to the angel doll that she made, which could also be linked to the prophecy. Secret Snowden Door On the very east side of Snowden Town, there's a large secret door. By dodging all of the Kickstarter credits, you can unlock the door, revealing a small white annoying dog who has somehow coded the entire game. 
there's no real purpose to this room other than being an easter egg. However, one thing to note is that the door showcases the Delta Room symbol, and the annoying dog within the room is supposedly working hard, and... Well... The mayor is Noelle's mom. This is a theory proposing the idea that Noelle's mom is the mayor of Deltarune's town. The mayor is very busy, and Noelle says that her mom doesn't like to be bothered while she's working. She also lives in the biggest house in the town, perhaps signifying the power that she holds. The AC in her office is always on full blast, which would be fitting for a monster that usually lives in cold climates, like a reindeer. Sans Undertale Meme a meme that was popular several years ago. It was a bait and switch of the character being shown on screen, being replaced with Sans and his trademark blue eye as Megalovania plays. Christopher Moon. You've probably seen this name on many Undertale YouTube videos. He's the Justin Y of Undertale YouTube comments. He even commented on my last video. Hi, Chris. Elu Tran. Speaking of famous Undertale YouTubers, this guy uploaded the entire Undertale soundtrack, and he's got tens of millions of views from it. If you look up Undertale, you're bound to find this guy. And, uh, he's kind of tired of hearing it. Go check him out to hear him info dump about Bug Fables. And also, please check out Bug Fables, it's really good. Typing characters' names when choosing your name. If you type in a character's name on the Choose Your Name screen of Undertale, some funny dialogue will show up, mostly the characters telling you that you can't steal their names. Except for Papyrus. He'll allow it. Flowey calling you out after going back from killing Toriel. If you kill Toriel, then reload right after, Flowey will straight up call you out on it. This is one of the most iconic examples of the game fucking with you. And this definitely happened to me too, and definitely got me more invested to play the full game. Pizza Call. If your fun value is between 46 and 50, Alphys will call you in the middle of Snowden to buy a pizza, but instead accidentally sends ASCII art of an anime cat girl. Bruh. Sans Refrigerator Call. If your fun value is between 40 and 45, Sans will prank call you in the middle of Snowden to ask if your refrigerator is running. Typical Sans. Hello? Can I speak to G- If your fun value is between 2 and 39, you will get a call from an unknown character in the same location. They'll say, Hello, can I speak to G- Then realize they dialed the wrong number. Then sing the wrong number song. It's heavily debated who this G is referring to, but most suspect it's Gaster. In the Japanese localization of Undertale, this line is straight up untranslated. I... The, the poop shitters. I think... I... I think this kind of just explains itself. Toriel accidentally killing you. If you're low on HP during Toriel's fight, she'll intentionally direct the fireballs away from you to prevent killing you. However, if you move your soul to the wall, you can actually make the fireballs kill you. For a split second, you can see your shocked expression before you get sent to the game over screen. This face is honestly haunting to me. You can clearly tell she didn't intend to even hurt you, and her straight up killing you broke her heart. The Dark World is a game. When Chris and Susie reappear in the overworld, they're surrounded by toys in the closet. Judging by this image, a lot of the Dark World can be parallel to what's on the floor here, such as the Field of Hopes and Dreams being a purple carpet, and the checkerboard area being represented by... a checkerboard. There's also the fact that Chris's weapon in the Dark World is a wood blade, while their weapon in the Overworld is a pencil. If you buy the Spooky Sword and have Chris equip it, it'll turn into a Halloween pencil in the Overworld. This could imply that, in some form, the Dark World is a game that was played by Susie and Chris. Bone Trussell Trailer Version This version of Bone Trussell is the version that plays in the trailer. This version is an extended take that's not in the game itself. This version of the song is present in the Collector's Edition soundtrack. The Mystery Key The Mystery Key is an item you can buy from Braddy and Caddy's shop for 600 gold. You can use it to unlock the door to Metaton's house. Once inside, you can find five separate diaries that Metaton used, detailing the beginning of the development of his robot body and his friendship with Alphys. Razai blushing when near Chris. 
When Chris stands near Rao's eye for a few seconds, Rao's eye will start blushing. Shom referencing Gaster. After defeating Jevil and returning to Shom's shop, he will tell you that he was forced to lock Jevil away. This is what he had to say about this. As the court mage and his only companion, I was forced to lock him away. Or rather, lock us all away, in his own words. Since that time, the strange words he said have stuck inside my cotton, and my view of this world has become darker, yet darker. When does Undertale take place? The time period of Undertale is not something that's discussed too often, but it's still a topic worth bringing up. The only two things we know for sure is that Chara fell in 2001X, and the trophy in Asgore's house says 98, possibly implying that he won the trophy in 1998. However, a few things don't make sense. Papyrus' undernet name is CoolDude95, and Undyne's undernet name is CoolFish91. Now, with usernames like those, most of the time, the username correlates with the user's birth date. It wouldn't make sense for Papyrus and Undyne to be born in the 1990s. They weren't alive during Jara's time, and they don't even recognize Toriel when they first see her. So, what if they're born during the 2090s? This sounds ridiculous, but remember that Asgore and Toriel are boss monsters. They're said to live for hundreds of years at a time. Sans implies that Toriel has been in the ruins for a hundred years, saying that when he told her a joke, she howled for a long time. Like it's the best joke she's heard in a hundred years. So, I think it's safe to assume that Undertale takes place around 100 years after Char fell down, or around 2100 or 2110X. Blue Attack's Color Change the color of the blue attacks was changed to a deeper shade of blue in version 1.001 to help colorblind players see them better. Nagito Komeda Kanye West likes fingers in his ass. Sans' Sneakers Most in-game art of Sans shows him wearing slippers. However, in his overworld sprite, he wears no shoes at all. However, however, his other promotional art has him wearing blue sneakers. What's even weirder is that the new game plush version of the Sans plush has him with these sneakers on instead of the slippers he came with in his first iteration by Fangamer. If I were to make a comparison, Sans' sneakers are like toys of Bart Simpson wearing a blue shirt. Beta screenshot on Steam page. Undertale's Steam page has multiple screenshots from the game itself, you know, as you'd expect. However, it appears the third image is from a beta version of the game. The normal path to the right of the room isn't there and is instead above the player, and you would have to go up into the ruins originally. That comedian. During Genocide Route, if you save in Snowden, sometimes the text, That Comedian, will appear in red. Many, MANY people assume this referred to Sans, with Chara stating their hatred for him. When this is far from the truth. If you save and you haven't killed Snowdrake completely, That Comedian will appear if you save. Once all the Snowdrakes are dead, it won't appear. If you fail to kill Snowdrake before reaching Snowden, the narrator will state, the comedian got away. Failure. Indicating that the genocide route was aborted. It's really funny that this line got so misinterpreted. Imagine if the fandom knew exactly what it was referring to and ran with it. Snowden Town Genocide Music The Snowden Town music gets slowed down by 75% after exhausting the kill count. To hear this music in-game, you would have to kill everybody by grinding on the bridge at the end, then immediately go into Snowden Town so that But Nobody Came doesn't play. It's a common occurrence for people to get their kills at the beginning of Snowden Forest rather than at the end, so this music isn't heard that often because of that. Shiren Tile The Shiren Tile is a seemingly discolored event tile, since you encounter Shiren as soon as you step on it. However, it seems that this was just a tile editor mistake with Game Maker. The Shiren encounter is actually based on step count, and it seems to line up with the amount of steps it takes to touch this tile. Strangely enough, there seems to be a lot of discolored tiles in Undertale. 
Sans and Papyrus come from Deltarune. This is a popular theory that Sans and Papyrus don't originate from Undertale's world, but from Deltarune's world. Not only does Sans have deep connections to Deltarune's Dark World, as explained in the last video, but remember when Snowden's shopkeeper explained the two simply showed up one day? What if this means the Bone Brothers simply came from another world entirely? Naming yourself Gaster If you name yourself Gaster at the start of the game, it simply boots you back to the intro. Undertale the Musical at Metaton's One True Love performance, the game's window will be renamed to Undertale the Musical, not to be confused with the unofficial musical. Which segues to... Undertale the Musical. Undertale the Musical is a series created by Man on the Internet that takes the OST of Undertale and turns it into a musical. It's beautiful. If you haven't listened to it already, please do. After you watch this video, of course. Man on the Internet also created some musical songs for Deltarune, so check those out too. Sense of Deja Vu At certain points in the game, if you reset or reload, characters in the game will say that Frisk seems familiar to them, despite the fact that they've technically never seen them before. This applies to Toriel, Papyrus, Undyne, and Alphys. I'll read one of the instances of that happening here. When Toriel asks you what flavor of pie you want, if you reset or reload, she'll say this. Cinnamon or butterscotch? Wait, do not tell me. Is it butterscotch? If you say yes, it continues as, hee hee hee, I had a feeling. When humans fall down here, uh, strangely, I, I often feel like I already know them. Truthfully, when I first saw you, I felt like I was seeing an old friend for the first time. Strange, is it not? Well, thank you for your selection. Hard Mode Flying Suplex Fairly recently, on February 23rd, 2021, Toby Fox tweeted out this. I don't know if I ever mentioned this, but originally at the end of Undertale's Hard Mode, when Toriel hugged you goodbye in the ruins, there was a pause, then it turned into a flying suplex, a Zuna drop, which exploded when she hit the ground. I didn't do this, though. References in Henry Stickman the Henry Stickman Collection is... well, I don't even need to introduce you to this game, do I? Most of you probably already know of the reference I'm going to talk about. But for those who don't know, the Henry Stickman Collection is a point-and-click adventure game that is a collection of all of Henry's Flash game adventures and ties it up into a professional package. The game is known for including pop culture and meme references within it, and Undertale is no exception. In completing the mission's pathway, Little Nest Egg, Henry breaks into a train and soon runs to the train's conductor, Mr. Macbeth. Henry enters an Undertale-like battle to fight Mr. Macbeth. There's a song that plays here reminiscent of Metal Crusher, which is titled Tickets Please. If you choose to fight, Macbeth fills Henry full of bullets. The fail text then says, seeing the conductor riddle you with bullets, it fills you with determination. There's one more slightly obscure reference to Undertale in this game. In the pathway Jewel Baron, at one point you have to select the teleporter, which Henry Stickman tosses in anger. It breaks, and Henry is teleported through multiple different areas, one of which is a pitch black room with Sans's head and the phrase bad time scribbled in the top left. Ralzai's Manual Ralzai's Manual is an item given to you by Ralzai after finishing the tutorial fight with the dummy. If you try throwing away the manual, at first Ralzai will stop you, but if you do it a second time, he'll get sad and say that'll make a better one for next time. You can never actually read the manual in-game, but it can be found within the assets. The pages are a fairly basic but cute rundown of what the controls, commands, and menu do, drawn entirely by Ralzai like a third grader's Valentine's Day card. Strange Failsafe Poem in Deltarune, if there's not any text assigned to a certain object, this strange failsafe poem will be read. Is that a cut on your face, or part of your eye? The gash weaves down as if you cry. The pain itself is reason why. This seems to describe Gaster's sprite, as there's two large slashes in his eyes. There's also failsafe text used primarily for signs, which could be a reference to the blueprints in Sansa's workshop. You can't read these symbols. Or maybe it's the handwriting. You will regret this. 
After refusing to sell an item to the temp shop shopkeeper twice, she will say, You will regret this. What a total 180. Unused human reflection. While in debug mode, if you go to the puddle area in Waterfall, Frisk's reflection in the water is of a completely different human being. This human has a yellow shirt with green stripes, blue pants, and a shadow covering their eyes. It's possible this design later influenced Chris's design in some way, as the two bear a striking resemblance. This is pure speculation, but it's likely that during the genocide route, this human would have appeared in the reflection to show the player that they're not the only one in control. But it refused wordplay. The term, but it refused, is a pun. The soul literally refuses together when it breaks during Azrael's fight. God damn it, Toby. Don't tell that to the other Sanses, okay? After Sans dunks on you, and you reload to the part where Sans offers mercy again, he will say that, because of you coming back, you two were never really friends in the first place, and to not tell that to the other Sanses. Obviously, Sans knows about the other timelines, and this just reinforces that. The AU community had a whole field day with this line. Game Facts Controversy In late 2015, a popular video game site Game Facts held their yearly contest to see what the best video game ever made was. A bit of a bold claim for a single website to make, but okay. As Undertale's popularity was sky high at the time of the polling, it demolished all of the other games, including some well-loved classics like The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and it won the poll. This sparked massive outrage on GameFAQs, with users all over the site fighting over whether or not the win was justified. Just another crazy internet argument. And GameFAQs being salty. As usual. Room Water Mushroom Room Water Mushroom is an unused room intended to be used in Waterfall at some point in development. The main attraction of this room is a monster that begs you to tell him what the room to the right of him is like, as he is stuck to the floor. You can never tell him what the outside is like, unfortunately, because the room to the right is a glitchy test room that you can't get out of at all. Yet another tragic story in the grand scheme of Undertale's plot. Room Sprite Check this is a test room made to check every single sprite in the game. They show up in rapid succession while Undyne's head just chills in the middle. Very weird room. Dog Troid ending. On the Undertale Tumblr page, Toby had this to say. Originally, I was going to make it if you beat the game fast enough, you'd be able to see the annoying dog in a bikini. This is a reference to the original Metroid, where Samus would take off her armor if you beat the game very quickly. Before the Story on PS4 theme. The song Before the Story, before being used in Deltarune, haha, <laughs> was used on the Undertale PS4 theme. Could this have been foreshadowing for Deltarune's existence? Alternate Mad Mew Mew Overworld Sprites. Upon opening the doors of the Dog Shrine, Mad Mew Mew will have one of three Overworld Sprites at random. A pink dress, a white dress, and the rarest, a black dress. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that. This is a weird word in the crossword puzzle in Snowden. What's even weirder is that it's spelt incorrectly on the search word itself, with the E replaced with a U. I guess Sans was right when he said it was unsolvable. The red soul is not Chris's soul. There is a load of evidence to suggest that Chris's soul is not their own. The biggest piece of evidence is during the ending to the first chapter of Deltarune. The player can still control the red soul in the cage, and Chris is acting on their own. However, it seems to run much deeper. Take a look at this damn description for Chris in the Dark World. Body contains a human soul. A human soul. Not their human soul. Characters around town also mention that Chris seems to have been acting off lately, and not like themselves. If they're being controlled by a separate human soul, then this would make sense. Chris also seems to know more things than they should. This would imply that the soul knows more than Chris does. 
The soul has met Sans before, which is why you can tell him, great to see you again, despite the fact Chris has never met him before, which Sans points out. You can also ask Undyne about her relationship with Alphys, despite the fact that she doesn't know her at all. So, who is this soul? Well, it could be a representation of the player themselves. It was recommended you play Undertale before playing Deltarune, and who could know more about Undertale's characters than Undertale fans? There's also the possibility that the soul is Frisk. They experience the same things the player did, and the narrator copies some of the narration from the past too. Either way, it's safe to assume that Chris is not controlled by that red soul. I will link a Tumblr post by Susie Undertale in the description that goes more in depth and describes two other theories that I recommend you check out. Snow on top of all sentry stations. There's snow on top of all of Sans' sentry stations, even the one in Hotland. One of the hot dog customers comments on how weird that is too. Fans have theorized that all of the stations could all just be one station that teleports around from Snowden, just like Sans does. Or it could be an excuse to not sprite multiple sentry stations. Either way, it's lazy, so it fits Sans. Megalovania in Bring It In, guys. If you listen closely, you can hear a small part of Megalovania in Bring It In, guys. Dusty toys have Azrael's dust on them. If you read in the library, it's said that a monster's dust is spread on their favorite thing when they die. And when you check the plushies in New Home, it says the toys are dusty. Does this mean that the toys have Azrael's dust? Not exactly. Azrael's dust was spread on the flowers in Asgore's throne room, and one of them would eventually become Flowey. But it's not impossible to say that they decided to scoop up some of his dust and put it on his toys. Rock Candy Rock Candy is an unused item that heals 1 HP. The way you would have obtained it would be in a room with a bowl of rock candies on a pedestal. If you try to take all of the candies, you can't, as the weight of the rock candy is so heavy you can only take one. This room was later replaced by the Spider Bake Sale, and the concept of taking candy from a bowl was later reworked into the Monster Candy Room. The flavor text for the rock candy states this. Here is a recipe to make this at home. Step 1. Find a rock. Frisk might need to go to a dentist after eating this. Bed Inspector. If you check all of the beds in Card Castle, you will be granted the title of Bed Inspector. No bed shall go unchecked when Chris is around. Canatines Designing Characters. I've mentioned this before in the last iceberg, but I'll mention this again. Canotines is the creator of Lancer, The King, Rudin, and Hathi. They were originally made for a deck of playing cards and nothing more. However, Toby was so inspired by their designs to the point that he asked if he could use them for his game. Canotines thinks it's wild that these characters have taken on a life of their own now. Slow Dancing with Metaton During Metaton's musical bit, you could originally dance alongside him, which would make him comment on how strange you are at dancing. This was later re-implemented into the Xbox One version. The Spell Button The Spell Button is an unused menu icon that would seemingly allow the player to cast magic. According to Toby, he never really had any idea of what the function of the button would be, so he never used it. ABC News During a report about their outfit slowing down in China, Sans's theme plays with some mild fluctuations. Some areas are recovering better than others. It's unclear why this song in particular was used or even if they had permission to use it at all. But I highly doubt it. Undertale.com HTML message In the HTML code of Undertale.com, a hidden message can be found that states, What are you doing? Looking for secrets? Don't put your nose where it doesn't belong. Or you might learn something you don't like. Hee <laughs> Open coffins and mummy wrappings 
After Azriel's fight, all the coffins in Asgore's basement open up, except for the red one. When you check it at this point, the narrator says, You didn't notice before, but there's something inside. Mummy wrappings are at the bottom of it. This implies that the coffins didn't simply have souls inside, but the bodies of the former humans too, which seemed to disappear after True Pacifist. Which doesn't make too much sense, but I'll let it slide. It's possible that the human souls went free after the barrier broke, and this is the game's way of symbolizing that, which makes sense. However, what's especially creepy about this is that, during the genocide route, if you check the closed coffin, the narrator says, it's as comfortable as it looks. Dog check. If the player tries to edit their save file and it corrupts in some fashion, you appear in an error handling room named Dog Check. The room is simply a black screen that has the annoying dog in the center, either dancing or sleeping. This error handling room is used in Deltarune as well. The best part about this room is the music that comes with it. In Deltarune, there's Dog Check, And in Undertale, there's Sigh of Dog, and also my personal favorite, Dance of Dog. You surely would have been blasted to... Added in version 1.001, Papyrus says this line while giving you a room tour after sparing him in a genocide route. This quote implies that Sans isn't the only one who can use the Gaster Blasters. Papyrus can too. Even further evidence that Papyrus can use Gaster Blasters is on page 28 of the art book, where it shows a skull-shaped object in his box of weapons, and written above it it says, probably not a skull. If it wasn't for that annoying you're really kind of a freak, huh? Upon reloading your save after killing Sans twice, he will say, That expression you're wearing. You're really kind of a freak, huh? Beating Asgore in one hit. This is an unused goof, as Toby puts it. Originally, if you somehow beat Asgore in one hit, Flowey would chill up and look super surprised. He'd say, Uh, you win? before burying into the ground and goofy sitcom music would play as the credits roll. What's interesting about this is that there are actually unused sprites for Flowey in the final game that seem to reference this cut ending. Empty House Empty House is a track that plays when going back into Toriel's house after killing her. What's weird is that, despite being listed in the demo OST and being featured in the final game, it's not actually listed anywhere in the final soundtrack. Gay! When you talk to Burger Pants outside of ICE's pizza, he'll mention this about one of the mascot characters standing outside. Purple guy. Man. That guy. You gotta... Actually, does that guy even work here? If you know anything about Five Nights at Freddy's, this seems to be a direct reference to that series. Not only is a character named Purple Guy supposedly working at a pizza place, he's also wearing a mascot costume, just like William Afton is known to do. Jevil's voice actor is Toby. One thing people haven't been able to get a concrete answer of is who Jevil's voice actor is. It's not even in the credits. The only credible theory, it seems, is that it's Toby Fox himself voicing Jevil. Both the English and Japanese voice lines for Jevil sound like they were done by the same actor, and Toby is known to have learned Japanese. I can do anything. Flowey's Japanese voice actor has also been confirmed to be Toby, and Flowey's Japanese voice sounds similar to Jevil's voice. <laughs> Photoshop Flowey name confusion. Despite most people calling Flowey's all-powerful form Omega Flowey, the actual name for this form is Photoshop Flowey. However, this form has yet another name. In the game's files, his sprites are named Flowey X. So, what name is canon? It's ultimately up to personal preference, but Omega Flowey has become his unofficial name with fans, and even his official tarot card names him Omega Flowey. Sans Me Hand Change On April 4th, 2020, Sakurai tweeted out a picture of Sans' Me costume. 
However, people quickly noticed that the model had a different hand than the final product, which had weird-looking fingers. Ugh. Toby later commented that he requested they change the fingers to a mitten-like hand instead. And honestly, that's for the better. The Spade Queen The Spade Queen, or just the Queen, as referred to by Jevil, is an unseen character that is only spoken of by Jevil after beating him with violence. He states that the Queen will return soon so it could be possible she'll appear in Chapter 2, or at least in another future chapter. Alarm Clock App The Undertale Alarm Clock App was the ill-fated $32,500 stretch goal for the Kickstarter. Development on this app was paused for various reasons, with one of them being that Toby wanted to work on Deltarune instead. However, the finished dialogue for the Clock app was posted online on Undertale's 5-year anniversary, which gave some nice details that I may or may not have discussed before. My favorite piece of trivia we learned from this is that Sans canonically did the Fortnite default dance during a soccer game, and Alf has told him that was cringe culture. That- that's real. That's not a meme. It's not a meme, that's real. Lab Monitor on Mac on the Mac version of Undertale, when you enter Alphys' lab, sometimes, rather than showing the human walking around on Alphys' monitor, it shows a static image of the human staring right into the screen. Creepy, huh? It's possible this is just a glitch with the Mac version, but who knows at this point. Megalovania is the player's theme. People commonly associate Megalovania with Sans, and they have good reason to, but it might not even be his battle theme at all. First off, Sans attacks you first, as opposed to any other fight in the game where it's your turn first. This could be symbolism that you are the boss in this fight, as you're the villain in this scenario. Also consider Megalovania's name. A megalomaniac is someone who is obsessed with power and dominating others. This title doesn't fit Sans at all, but it does fit for the player. The player is focused on nothing but killing every monster they come across and with every kill, their power grows stronger. Char explains this to the player at the end of Genocide. You could also argue that Megalovania would also fit Chara for this exact same reason, as they become very power-hungry during Genocide. Alphys' Crush in Code If you look in the game's code in the string of Metaton's question, who does Alphys have a crush on, you'll find the text, LOL, if you came to this part of the code to see who I have a crush on, you're out of luck. This is fairly interesting, because nearly no other character in Undertale is able to directly talk in the code and refer to it as such. Most likely, this is merely a joke to poke fun at the data miners who were snooping in here, but it's food for thought. Mew's King Description Mew's King Description is an unused track for, as Toby puts it, when Asgore is being described. It's a more regal-sounding version of the Determination theme, which definitely fits a king. The One Behind You, with a creepy smile. This is a quote by a monster in a cut room in Waterfall. They point out that a strange friend with a creepy smile is behind Frisk, who then disappears. As Frisk is in tall grass, you can't actually see if this mysterious friend is there or not. This friend could either be Chara or Gaster, as both share a smile and both could realistically be following Frisk around. This strange encounter could be a reference to White Hand from Pokemon Red and Blue, as in both instances, an NPC calls out something strange that you can't see. Shay Shay is a popular Undertale speedrunner and talented piano player. He holds the world records for both True Pacifist and True Pacifist Glitchless in 1.00. He also held the Genocide world record in the past, among others. Hotland Tree and Puddle If you decide to pour out all of the water from the water cooler in Hotland, a small tree will start growing from the puddle in the True Pacifist ending. Serious Mode Serious mode is a battle mode that is activated in certain fights if the battle is deemed as serious. Items that have been shortened as jokes will be abbreviated in a less funny way. This mode activates when fighting Toriel, Asgore, Azriel, Undyne the Undying, and Sans. Raozai quoting Flowey. When giving you a tutorial on the battle menu, Raozai will say, See that heart, Chris? That's your soul. 
the culmination of your being. This is an almost exact direct quote from Flowey, who also gives you instructions on fighting. Luke Skywalker. Checking Luke's states this. Don't pick on him. Family name, Iwalker. Luke's full name would then be Luke Skywalker, a pun on the name Luke Skywalker. Wow, you are super fast at being wrong. If you manage to pull the wrong lever down before Toriel tells you to, a buzzer will go off and text pops up reading, Wow, you are super fast at being wrong. It's very tricky to pull this off in later versions, so you probably haven't seen it. So sorry, Overworld Sprite. Temi made an Overworld Sprite for So Sorry that was never used in any version, except the Switch version, and I believe the Xbox One version, but don't quote me on that. You could see him standing outside the art club room in the true pacifist ending, and you could even talk to him for some dialogue. Papyrus using an asterisk. Papyrus, for some odd reason, never uses an asterisk to start his sentences, something every other character in the game does. The only time he's ever included an asterisk in his sentence is when he's imitating someone else. One theory that has sprung up is that the asterisks for the Papyrus font are way too small to be used, so they went unused. Attack and Defense Lies The game frequently lies to you about attack and defense values. Many monsters are far weaker than what the check act states. For example, Minotaur Neo is stated to have a defense stat of 9, but his actual defense is negative 40,000. Wow, Alphys, you really fucked up on that department. Gaster caused Jevil's insanity. The only concrete information we have on the cause of Jevil's insanity is that one day he met a strange someone and, soon after, his outlook on life changed. Gaster is someone who is definitely strange and would cause someone to see life in a totally new way after being scattered across time and space. And also, as I said earlier, Shom says that Jevil's view on the world made his outlook on life darker yet darker. You can also hear Gaster's theme in The World Revolving as well perhaps signifying a connection between the two characters. Sprite Chris Place. This is a placeholder sprite for the Dark World version of Chris. It looks very silly. In this land, only eyes blinded by darkness can see the way. This quote is from an inscription in the first area in the Dark World. It may be referring to how almost all the main characters of the Dark World have their eyes shadowed out, might have some significance later, but who knows. Metaton hired Muffet. This series states how Metaton hired Muffet to kill you. Muffet says that the one who hired her offered her lots of money for your soul, something Metaton has lots of considering his hotel. She also said they had a sweet smile and changed shape, something Metaton is definitely known for. Goner Maker. The Goner Maker is what the game refers to the vessel making sequence as. The name is very interesting. Is it implying we're making a Goner or Gaster follower version of Chris? The gray colors could indicate that. Sans's Nice Cream. This is referring to this unused sprite of Sans eating ice cream. Look at him go. Deltarune checking if you've installed Undertale. A rumor spread during the first few days of Deltarune's release that said the game checks for Undertale save files, like genocide saves, which is a reason as to why Toby asked you to play Undertale first. However, this is not true at all. This was just a widely believed rumor at the time. Cut Raozai Fight Before the final version, you were actually meant to fight Raozai instead of the tutorial dummy. YouTuber KRZYSH has managed to mostly restore the fight, so you can see it in an info card I'll link in the top right. Go check it out. Wrist Protector The Wrist Protector is a hidden item that's used to skip text much faster than normal. You can get this item by entering the Dark World in less than 8 minutes. It should be on the floor of the first room. The reason this is here is that it may have been implemented for speedrunners as a tongue-in-cheek joke, as, you know, speedrunners run their hands dry playing games all the time. It might also be a reference to Toby's wrist pain. <laughs> B. 
big boner down the lane. I mentioned this in my last video for unused text that was used in Undertale, but I never really explained where it came from. This was used to test Omega Flowey's text box at the beginning. It was never meant to show up, and for good reason. Robot Husband Broken Promise In the planned features section in the Undertale Kickstarter, it says, Become friends with all of the bosses. Hilariously bad dating sim segments. Seriously, you can literally have a robot husband. It might be obvious, but at no point in the game can you date Metaton, nor have him become your husband. However, this might have been added at some point, so it wasn't an entirely empty promise. The main menu theme has six variations which play depending on where you are in the game and how many characters you've befriended. Another variation exists in the game files between the fifth and sixth used songs, suggesting there was meant to be a dating sequence with the seventh character. On January 8th, 2017, Toby tweeted out a picture of old Metaton dialogue, which was possibly used for his dating sequence. It reads as, I cannot express my feelings in words. Please listen to this MIDI file instead. Live in La Vida Loca plays. What a romantic. Loose Line Clown Stickers. There are these strange stickers called Loose Clown, made for the line messaging app that show a clown with strange quotes. Now what does this have to do with Deltarune? Well, it seems that Jevil uses some of the lines from these stickers, such as I could do anything and Metamorphosis. I genuinely have no clue why Jevil is based on these. Although, Toby's used these stickers before when he's messing around on Twitter, so it might be a part of an inside joke. Side note, some of these stickers are really fucking weird. I am a protagonist, actual shape, and this one has some weird shadow clown? Who would use these in an actual conversation? First Anniversary Unrevealed Tracks On the first anniversary of the release of Undertale, five never-before-heard tracks were posted to Tumblr. Dog Hole? Dog Troid An early version of Spear of Justice early version of Undertale and an early version of Alphys. Several factors went into why these early versions were scrapped or reworked, such as sounding too similar to other songs or not fitting the characters' personalities. No one is really sure why Dog Hole was scrapped, though. Maybe it was an early version of the theme for the Hidden Room and Waterfall? Prun Cell Fairly recently, Tumblr user TammyCat made this post. I had a dream I was playing Undertale and I got to the snowy area, and it was mostly the same, but Papyrus was replaced with this new character, Pruncel. Pruncel's sprite was a highly contrast black and white photorealistic eyeball, roughly twice as big as Papyrus, and looking directly at the viewer. Whenever Pruncel spoke, the music completely cut out, and instead of text, it was an ominous red glow emanating from the text box. Tammy Cat even made a picture to show what her dream was. Esquieta Hermanos. I'm so sorry, Spanish-speaking viewers. 
In Guacamele 2, a Mexican culture-inspired Metroidvania, there's an Undertale reference. Luchador parodies of Sands of Papyrus are shown on a poster in the game. Esqueto Hermanos means Skeleton Brothers for all my English-speaking hallways out there. Magic Glass In 2015, Toby tweeted out this set of posts. Bug, this character can walk over pits while following you. Walk around? My solution! Magic Glass that appears when they walk over pits! Tester, you can sort of clip out of bounds here harmlessly. Me. Looks like it's time for... Magical Glass. Magical Glass floor that appears only when you step on it. The solution to every game dev problem. I don't like this character very much. Magical Glass floor that replaces the character you don't like when you step on it. This whole game isn't good. Magical Glass that covers up the whole game when you step on it. Magic Glass kind of became a meme after this for a while, but only for a short bit. Intro Lukes In the Undertale demo and before Photoshop Flowey's boss fight, the boss monster that normally appears in the intro is replaced with a monster that looks like Lukes. Test Monster This is the first monster ever coded into Undertale. It's an early version of Froggit. You can even see this guy in the first battle screenshot for Underbound 2. Dog Command. The Dog Command is an unused command you can only see in the inaccessible manual. They are described in the manual as, A dog has eaten your commands. You can't do anything for the rest of your life. Homestuck References. There are many Homestuck references in Undertale, specifically because Toby Fox was not only a fan, but a contributor to Homestuck for a while. Fun fact, most of Undertale was coded in Andrew Hussey's basement. The monster Aaron could be a reference to Equius and his Lucis, especially because of his relationship with a cat-like character. Pyrope's name is a direct reference to Terezi Pyrope's name. The hard mode monster Megaspell largely resembles Gamzee Makara in both appearance and behavior, with both of them honking quite a bit. There's also a monster in the Metaton Resort that looks remarkably like Jade Harley. The areas in Undertale could also be inspired by various areas in Homestuck. The ruins resemble the Kingdom of Darkness, Waterfall resembles the Land of Wind and Shade, and Hotland resembles the Land of Heat and Clockwork. And we're still not done! A lot of songs in Undertale include references to Homestuck, but I'll only be going over the one big one. And no, I'm not talking about Megalovania. The song, Another Medium, is based off an unused Homestuck song titled Patient. The name Another Medium could be a reference to The Medium, one of the spaces where the comic takes place. We'll get more into Patient further down in the iceberg. There's definitely more references between the two series, but I, I think that's enough Homestuck for me in one lifetime. You just remembered something funny. In Alphys' lab, there's a bag of dog food you can inspect. Depending on your actions up to this point, the flavor text will be different. If you've been a pacifist up to this point, the text will state, It's a bag of dog food. It's half full. If you've killed a single monster, it will state, It's a half-empty bag of dog food. Notice the narrator's pessimistic change. When you kill all of the dogs in Snowden and have a kill count of at least 21, the narrator will state, It's a half-empty bag of dog food. You just remembered something funny. The fact something like this even happens is remarkable attention to detail, and it's just further proof that Char is the narrator. Genocide really seems to warp their mind. Unused Sans attacks. Sans has some unused attacks, and unlike Metaton Neo's unused attacks, these are actually unique. Upon looking at some of them, you can tell why they went unused. I mean, ju just look at this! How is this fair? However, what's more interesting is that three of these attacks are named Hell Variants, which are harder versions of Sans's normal attacks. Is this possibly what Sans's hard mode fight would have been like? Undyne's Cracked Armor Toby states in this tweet, If Undyne jumps off the cliff to save Monster Kid, when you fight her, her HP's lowered. I wanted to have her armor crack too, but I forgot. No head is connected, no body is connected. In the Xbox port of Undertale, if the controller becomes disconnected, sometimes a funny message will show up. In the true lab, however, 
this appears. I would not want to be the first person to encounter this. I'm a goofy goober, yeah. This error message. There's an error message Burger Pants can say if something goes wrong, which says exactly that. Spiders are cannibals. The Spider Bake Sale advertisement says, Come eat food made by spiders, for spiders, of spiders. This implies so many wrong things. This means spiders eat their own kind. And nobody in the game really sees anything wrong with this. Lancer's Stomach Mouth In Kenatine's artwork of Lancer, he is depicted as having a mouth on the stomach, but in-game you never see it. The king has a mouth stomach, so is this something the Lancer will get when he grows up, or what? Monster History Part 6, 7, and 8 this is three sets of unused text that was originally meant to be read in the library in Snowden. It goes into a monster's state when falling down, how powerful monsters get when absorbing human souls, and boss monsters' souls being the exception to the rule of souls disappearing immediately upon death. Ralzai is not what he seems. This is a long theory by Reddit user Kraf, but I'll try to summarize it as best as I can. There's a bit of evidence to suggest that Ralzai is actually a lightener and not a darkener. For one, his actual appearance without the black outfit is very white, probably indicating he's a lightener. There's no actual proof he's the Prince from the Dark either. The prophecy shows the human, the monster, and the Prince from the Dark, and while Chris and Susie are spitting images, Ralzai isn't, possibly being a hint that Ralzai isn't actually the Prince. It's also apparent that Ralzai is mirroring Flowey in many ways. Both of them have a belief they try to force onto others, with Flowey's being kill or be killed, and Ralzai's being to always be a pacifist. One comment by Reddit user ET Builder also mentions how Ralzai acts absolutely cutesy and perfect, and his character doesn't change much, if at all, by the end of the first chapter. Meanwhile, Lancer and Susie both go through an entire character arc. E.T. Builder says this was done intentionally for a twist later down the line that will show that Ralzai is building up a facade with a cutesy exterior. That sounds very in line with Undertale's and Deltarune's writing. Planned Thrash Machine Fight There's an unused song in Deltarune titled Thrash Rating that sounds a lot like a battle theme. It was probably meant for a battle against the Thrash Machine. Grilbert? This is some concept art of Grilby, and the dude looks like Dilbert. What else do I have to say? Broken Allergy Call Toriel is programmed to call you in the ruins to ask about you having any allergies. Obviously, she's asking because of an incident before. <coughs> but chances of this seem random if you don't know what you're doing. Some have speculated that this is a fun event, but that's not the case. It's a bug that's caused by reading a sign in the room, which causes the call to not activate for some reason. Defeated Ralzai Sprite When Ralzai is KO'd in battle, instead of kneeling down or something, he straight up just vanishes. Why does this happen? It may have something to do with the unending pillar of light or the fountain, which gives his body form as explained in the manual. The XXX Man. On May 12, 1922, stay with me, a column was posted in the Washington Times titled The XXX Man. No, it's not what you're thinking of. It's basically ASCII art made by a typewriter, showing how expert typists can make art on typewriters. Now, the image shown off in this column is. Wait a minute. Gerson Boom Name Origin. Gerson Boom, the shopkeeper in Waterfall, is named after two top Smash 64 players, Super Boom Fan, aka Boom, and Gerson, and comes from one infamous match between the two. It's an hour-long match, and it's non-stop turtling, hence why Gerson in-game is a turtle. 
The match is also the reason why Smash 64 matches now have an 8 minute timer, and why Hyrule Castle is now banned. Black and White Overworld Sprites Unlike all of the other overworld sprites of monsters in the game, Froggit is black and white, just like their battle sprite, unlike every other monster whose overworld sprite is colored in some way. Weird. Whiffing an attack on Metaton, Neo, and Genocide. There was a common misconception in Undertale's first few months that, if he messed up the attack on Metaton Neo, he would give a small speech on how Asgore will fall easily to you, and then the genocide run would be invalidated. This messed up ending actually comes from a murder-heavy neutral route, and Metaton EX tells you this instead. Papyrus looking through the phone. Papyrus seems to know what the player is doing by looking through the phone. One example of this is at the arrow puzzle in Hotland. He'll ask you to draw a picture of the puzzle and hold it up to the phone. Now, that would be normal if you had a modern phone, but the phone you have is too old to receive texts, much less video chat. How does that work? Temi knows about the save function. The shopkeeper Temi, while talking to her about Temi armor, offers you a scholarship to help lower the price of the Temi armor and says, if you lose a lot of battles, Tem will lower the price. This means she knows you can die and come back with a save, like Flowey and Sans do. But that just begs the question, how the hell does she know that? Sans Sleep Font. When Sans falls asleep during his fight, large Zs appear above his head in a cartoony fashion. The font for these Zs is actually known, Aster. Wait, doesn't Aster sound... familiar? Metaton and Snowden Most people think that the tile puzzle machine in Snowden isn't actually Metaton, and that it's just a classic case of sprites being reused. But it is him! If you backtrack to Snowden after meeting him, the machine will be gone. Further evidence to support this is that unused text found among other dialogue for Snowden's residence says, Pathetic human! I am Metaton, big time sexy robot lover. Based on this, it's safe to assume that you were meant to talk to him in the tile puzzle room at some point. Cut sprites for being too detailed. Indeed, there are sprites that were cut for being too detailed or too good looking, as Toby puts it, like Doge and the Papyrus Thinking Sprites. Sans's room is in another world. This theory ties into the idea that Sans is a darkener. Not only is the door to Sansa's room the same door from the Dark World that allows you to teleport around, Papyrus literally says his room is like another world. And knowing Sans, he's definitely hiding something behind that door. By the way, I was going to say something, but I forgot. After having lunch with you at Grillby's, Sans says, By the way, I was going to say something, but I forgot. This is a weird line that's never really explained. One theory is that he stops time, asks you about the flower Papyrus is talking to, then unfreezes time, but to not look weird to the other patrons, says that he forgot what he was going to say. You can tell he's actually freezing time here as Grilby's head flame stopped moving. Jevil is aware he's in a video game. This is somewhat common knowledge at this point, but as Sham says after you fight Jevil, Jevil started viewing the world as a game. If he knows it's a video game, though, is uncertain. Chris's save file. When you save your game for the first time in Deltarune, there is another file titled Chris that gets overwritten. A very peculiar detail the game never points out. Risk and issue. In the same vein that Ralzai is an anagram for Azriel, Suzy is an anagram for issue, and Chris is an anagram for risk. Everyman. Everyman is one of the most obscure characters in the Undertale series. You've probably seen him as one of Reaper Bird's attacks, getting attacked himself by butterflies. He's also seen as dolls in Toriel in Asgore's home. You can also see him as graffiti in an alleyway in Deltarune. It might be a stretch, but Everyman could also be the model for the dummies in the game. The description for every man in the art book states he is just a good guy that shows up on occasion. It seems he's shaping up to actually show up in the upcoming Deltarune chapters based on these details and other details that we'll get into later. 
The leading theory is that every man is the equivalent of a stick figure in Monster Society, considering how he's graffiti and plushies, and also considering his name, Every Man. Deltarune True Genocide Deltarune True Genocide means actually killing the monsters you encounter in Deltarune instead of them running away. The common theory is that in later chapters, this will actually happen. As it stands now, it doesn't make any sense that XP and LV are implemented in the game since there's no way to get it without cheating. Okay, so really quick side note before I get into the next layer. The next layer will not be narrated by me, but by Chi Seatbelt, the creator of the iceberg. So if it sounds like my balls dropped, yeah, it's Chi Seatbelt talking. F steak. F steak is an abbreviated name for face steak. This only appears if you name the human Drac, Gigi, or Guju. F steak originates from a Persona 4 fan comic titled Hi, I'm Daisy from Gigi Digi, who you might recognize from the last video for making Cucumber Quest. File version 0.6.6.6. .6. The file installer for Deltarune is version 0.6.6.6. .6. Gaster's stats are also both 666. Coincidence? I think not. Monsters provide their own check info. Checking a monster's stats is more complicated than you'd think, at least in a narrative sense. Checking certain monsters elicits a reaction as if they know what the check says about them, such as Naps Blue taking offense to being told that they don't have a sense of humor. What's interesting is that Glide, the secret boss in Snowden, suggests that monsters provide their own check info. Its check info states, refuses to give more details about its statistics. From this, we can infer that Glide is so self-absorbed it didn't even want to tell you what its stats are. This means it's possible that some check stats are provided by the monsters themselves. One final interesting thing to note is that it's possible monsters lie about their stats. As we've gone over before, the stats we get from checking a monster don't line up with the monster's actual stats. For example, Undying the Undying stats are listed as 99 attack and 99 defense, but in reality, her stats are 12 attack and 5 defense. The four main areas represent the four seasons. The four areas of the game, the Ruins, Snowden, Waterfall, and Hotland, correspond with the four seasons. The ruins represents fall as there are fallen leaves everywhere, there's a tree with leaves that constantly fall off, and finally the game starts with the human falling down. You know Toby loves his puns. Snowden represents winter with the obvious snow and Christmas theme to the area everywhere. Waterfall represents spring with as many puddles of water and tall grass. And finally Hotland represents summer as an obviously hot area with the place being seen as a sort of vacation spot. Not only are the connections obvious, but there's proof that this was intentional. The Monster Kids word search lists each of the four seasons on the left, and the main characters you encounter in the areas in the middle. Fall with monsters, winter with skeletons, spring with mermaids, and finally summer with robots. Asriel's Background Origin the Rainbow City background featured on Azrael's wings is from an arcade game titled Air Duel, with this being the background's original appearance. Ice's Glitched Sprite In early releases of Undertale, upon killing Ice and as they turn to dust, you can see the kill sprite for Eren in a recording sign in the bottom right corner. This is just a glitch though, and not some crazy evidence that Eren is every monster or some shit like that. Hidden Hotland Ledge There's an inaccessible ledge to the right side of the room where you find the apron and Hotland. When you first enter Hotland, you can see a shadowy figure quickly run away after looking at you from there. This is assumed to be one of the monsters that Metaton hired to kill you. Papyrus is based on Didon. 
On January 8th, 2017, Toby Fox tweeted out a picture of Papyrus' early designs. This character was very different from the Papyrus we know and love today. He wore a fedora and talked like a, you know, I'll just say it, he talked like a neck beard. Besides that, the design for his head was very different, so much so that it doesn't even look like a skeleton too much, but in fact he looks like Didion from Off. In the art book, Beta Papyrus makes another appearance, further cementing the neckbeard angle his early character had, with Toby himself even saying that he had no redeemed qualities. Toby also confirms that Papyrus' early designs were inspired by the Dian. The city is Papyrus' room. The new Deltarune screenshots show off a new futuristic looking city, which some are theorizing is Papyrus' room. Reddit user A. Hedel, in particular, put together some great points towards this theory. First of all, the city is filled with red cars, much like Papyrus' well-known red car bed. Another observation is that the city is tinted blue, something Papyrus is well known for with his blue attacks. Speaking of blue attacks, the city also has many stop signs and lights, which Sans uses as a metaphor for his blue attacks. They also say that the figures on the posters resemble Papyrus's action figures, but this is more of a stretch in my opinion. Also, finally, the fact that Toby says the city's actually pretty small could also point it towards being a toy world of Papyrus's world. Jevil Fight Background The background of Jevil's fight is a distorted grayish purple carousel. Here's the original source image of it. You brought up the topic of gun control. There's an unused encounter with another clover enemy in Deltarune, which has some interesting unused text. One of three sets of act options are chosen at random when fighting it, and the one that easily stands out the most is the option Gun Control. Selecting this option causes this to happen. You brought up the topic of gun control. Clover started to argue. I use a gamepad to aim. Idiot, mouse and keyboard. Please stop you two. Thankfully, gun control doesn't mean what it actually means. It's very likely Toby removed this bit of dialogue, as it would be a very, very out of left field joke compared to all the other pieces of lighthearted humor in the game. Ragel. Ragel, or Raggle, wh whatever the hell this guy's name is, is the little dancing mushroom guy in Temi Village. Lots of people know who he is, but most don't know his real name. Unusual Smile Association Reddit user Drayson pointed something out about smiles in the game that should pique interest. A lot of smiles in Undertale are associated with evil and negative things, as opposed to happy and positive things. This ties into Undertale's main theme of subverting the player's expectations. To list major examples of this, Flowey is seen smiling a majority of the game, the exclamation point speech bubble that starts a battle turns into a smiley face during genocide. The amalgamates overworld sprites have smiles on them. Kara smiles when you see them in the darkness. And nearly every main character smiles when they die in genocide. Azriel's attacks are inspired by others. Considering who knows how long Flowey messed with the world while he had his save and load powers, he knows a lot about the other characters' attacks from fighting them before. Okay, so of course, Azriel's first attack obviously mirrors his mom's fire attack, right? He even imitates the way Toriel intentionally misses your soul later on in the fight. His Chaos Buster imitates a Gaster Blaster as it shoots out a beam and even makes a noise similar to the Gaster Blaster. His all-powerful attack, the Hypergoner, can be based on two things. One, a Gaster Blaster, again, and two, the Determination Extraction Machine in the True Lab. Both are very skeletal-like in design, and it wouldn't be surprising if Azriel took inspiration from one or both of these things for it. Activity Level The Activity Level is a secret screen on Undertale's Start menu you can activate by pressing Shift or X five times. Activity Level A is shown if you get a neutral ending, B if you complete a pacifist route, and C if you fought Sans twice or killed him. No information is shown if none of these goals are met. Unused Jevil Attacks Jevil has a bunch of scrapped attacks still left over in the game data. The most interesting of these are the early Devil's Knife attacks. 
Some of them are hard, yeah, but most are super easy to cheese, so that's why they're most likely cut. SPR underscore Toriel Boss underscore Suicide. In the game files, there's a sprite similar to Toriel's sprite when she's been killed, but her expression is changed to her smiling, and the file name is called SPR underscore Toriel Boss underscore Suicide. This implies that Toriel would commit suicide in some form, and there would be no way to prevent her from dying. Jockington Icon Duplicates Okay, so there are 8 icons for Jockington in the game files of Deltarune. All of them are the same. What does this mean, Toby? What does this mean? Is this a joke? Is this a prank? Are you trolling us? Gaster Upside Down Face if you flip the mystery man sprite upside down, you can identify a new face in the sprite's body. Some may find him creepy, yeah, but he's my son now, and none of you can change that. Red Soul and Susie Fight During the section where you control Susie, the red soul you control throughout the game appears on the battle board during Lancer's attacks. So how does this make sense? Is it simply an oversight? Well, not quite. You see, unlike every other battle in Deltarune, where the soul appears from the top left, this soul appears from the top right. This proves this couldn't have been a mistake. The common theory is that the soul follows Susie to help her, with the soul being the player and all, once again tying into the idea that the soul isn't Chris's soul. Sideways Attack Power if you compliment Lancer one too many times when you first fight him, his attack power goes sideways for some reason because you compliment him too hard. This makes any damage points you take show up sideways. Sans in Fortnite. Yes, I'm serious about this one. According to a number of credible, influential Fortnite YouTubers who you should all get all your news from, Epic Games recently sent out a survey asking what characters people knew well for future crossover events. And on this list, I kid you not, there was Sans. You guys, the meme may be real soon. Flowey Hired Muffet This is the secondary theory behind the Metaton one. Flowey is a known trickster and would know information about you and the spiders from the ruins, which not many other characters know. The changing shape part is a little more of a reach, but Flowey does have facial expressions that do change his shape considerably. However, I believe that Metaton is more likely, considering he's very wealthy and could pay Muffet to kill you, while Flowey doesn't have a method of making money, besides stealing, of course. Interacting with K-Round's Crown If you mash through Rules Card's dialogue and run to the right after defeating K-Round, you can interact with this weird drifting crown thingy. Interacting with it at first says, Thar she blows, which is a reference to Moby Dick. In additional interactions with it say, it's going to live off a better life now. Unused Frogget in FNAF 2 In Five Nights at Freddy's 2, there's an unused sprite in the game's files that appears to depict a skull with the file name, Mike. People have tried to recreate what the full sprite would have looked like, and immediate comparisons to Froggit are made. Now obviously, this was not intended, but it's strange how so many people compare this sprite to the same enemy. Holding X during fights If you hold down either X or Shift when battling in Undertale, it makes you move at half speed. Sometimes it's broken though, like in the Papyrus Hangout section. This feature was removed in Deltarune. Doomed to Death of Karma If you take between 30 and 40 points of KR damage in Sans's fight, the flavor text will change to Doomed to Death of Karma. People thought this was inaccessible for some time, but it's not. It's just really hard to trigger without dying. E.N. Sports. It's in the game. E.N. is an extra stat that appears in pre-release screenshots of Undertale on the stats menu. Toby has stated E.N. stands for English, though it more likely stands for Energy, which is an unused stat in the code of the demo. Could this have, at one point, been for the unused spell attacks? Hidden Morse code in Your Best Nightmare shirt. 
On the inside of the Your Best Nightmare Fangamer shirt is Morse code, which translates to You called for help, but nobody came. You've come again to this wonderful place, now tear off the mask beneath your face. There's placeholder text in the event that there somehow isn't a monster to fight in Deltarune that says, You've come again to this wonderful place, now tear off the mask beneath your face. Now, I thought this might be a reference to a book or something like the Hell Cauldron in Undertale, but as I searched I couldn't find anything. It might be referring to the Gaster follower that's holding a part of Gaster, as it matches the rhyming scheme in most failsafe text in Deltarune. It seems to be referring to Gaster, but in my opinion, that's a stretch. Or maybe it's a Persona 5 reference. Yeah, no. Muffet dooms everyone in Genocide. In a Genocide run, if you don't immediately kill Muffet, she'll talk about how some person who looked like a total nerd, which is obviously Alphys, said to escape with her and then after she followed her, she would block off the rest of Hotland. However, Muffet does not go with Alphys, as she says, a spider never leaves her web. So if Hotland could have been fully locked off from the human, but due to Muffet's stubbornness, it was not, so she caused the total downfall of monster kind, basically. Unused Piano Interface There's an unused interface for the piano in Waterfall that actually shows the keys, and has many more keys than the piano in the final version. While the solution only has 8 notes involved, the old UI made it seem like the puzzle was more complicated than it actually was. On the High Swab OST commentary, one person said this on the subject. When I played Undertale, I got stuck on that stupid piano puzzle because the beta version, Toby let me play, didn't cut you off after 8 notes or whatever. I was one note off trying to play what I thought was the 32 note song. Rules card is Gaster. If you compare Rules card and Gaster together, you begin to notice similarities in their faces. While there isn't much other evidence to say that Rules card is Gaster, you can't deny the similar faces. You can also hear Gaster's theme if you listen closely to Rules Card's theme, but this is most likely a coincidence. Also, I just want to come in and say, yes, Rules Card's name is actually Rules Card and not Roxul Card or whatever. It's a pun on Rules Card. So yeah. Door Behind Waterfall Sentry Station There is a weird, inaccessible blue door behind the Sentry Station in Waterfall. Even with hacks, you can't go through it. What's on the other end? Temi ending. There was a rumor floating around for a few months after Undertale's initial release that, in the same style as the annoying dog ending, there was a Temi ruler ending as well. This is wrong, however, there is no Temi ending, unfortunately. Deltarune Virus Allegations Some antivirus programs have listed Deltarune as a threat when opened, but this is not the case at all. Deltarune does not have any malicious content inside. It's a false positive made by the program. OBJ underscore quiche guilt This is an unused feature that would involve you feeling immense guilt after throwing away the quiche. How out of all the cut content in this game, I feel like this one should have stayed in the most. I don't know why I feel that way, but I do. Santa's existence in the underground. So this is a bit of a random one. So Santa is a human created character, right? Then how did the monsters learn about him and use him in their culture? It's possible they learned about him through the trash being dumped into the underground, but besides that, I have absolutely no fucking clue. Or this could be a case of the magical thing called video game logic. Gaster created late into development. This is a discovery found by u slash carabilly underscore water on r slash underminers that Gaster was created far into development with evidence provided through the orders of the room, object, and music folders individually plus a few other factors. To sum it up, Toby came up with an early idea for Gaster while in the early stages of making the True Lab, to provide an explanation of Sansa's backstory. Then, at the very end of development, he added all the weird Gaster shit you know and love, like the Entry 17 room, the Gaster followers, and the sound test room. One thing to note is that the wrong number call was added with all the Gaster shit as well. More evidence that the mysterious G is, in fact, Gaster. 
Muse underscore pre dummy. Muse underscore pre dummy is the song that plays as Mad Dummy comes out of the water to lecture you. What's so strange about this song is that everyone seems to have forgotten about it. There's barely any remixes of it, and it's not on the OST either, even though short songs like Small Shock and Dog Bass are. Monsters won the war in Deltarune. In Deltarune, there's not a mention or trace of any other human living in Deltarune's world besides Chris. On top of that, monsters aren't educated about humans, as a bunny monster asks if it hurts to be made out of blood. While there isn't much other evidence to support this, as there's no real mention of a human monster war, it could be an interesting concept, as Deltarune is shaping itself up to be a different world than Undertale. Everyman Bullet Attack in Jevil's Fight When Jevil uses his bird carousel attack, there's a small chance for Everyman's head to show up on one of the birds. It's a 1 in 50 chance for this to happen. The Everyman bullet also appears on Jevil's fan gamer keychain. Egg equals Knight's Movements If you turn the word egg into wingdings, the hand symbols will read left, up, up. This is the movement of the knight chess piece. Is this proof that Gaster is connected to the knight in some way? Papyrus has less backstory than Gaster. We've talked about Gaster so goddamn much on this iceberg, to the point we can guess what his story will be like in Deltrune in some form. Same with Sans, as he definitely has more to him than what he lets on, and we can guess the backstory he has from clues and hints in the games. But what about Papyrus? Yeah, the brother to Sans, and presumably the son of Gaster? He's linked to both those characters we know so much about, and yet we know almost nothing about him. Like, sure, we can apply the same logic we do for Sans to Papyrus to explain his backstory, but there's nothing concrete to prove anything like that. We don't know where he came from, we don't know why he acts the way he does at points, we don't even entirely know if he's related to Sans, we don't even know if he's even going to be in goddamn Deltarune, bro. He could actually be, like, a straight up fucking Starman, for all we know. It's just so peculiar that one of the main characters in Undertale, links so heavily to the game's most important characters, just gets swept away under the rug with so much mystery to him. Art Club Room in Genocide If the Art Club Room is somehow entered in Genocide, the sign that would usually read what time the club will be will be replaced with a message saying, Art Club is cancelled. However, this is impossible to see without hacking, as the second floor of Hotland is blocked off in Genocide. I want to tell you something tomorrow, something I can only tell a friend. After naming Onion San at the lake, they will ask you to come back tomorrow as they have something that they can only tell a friend, as their expression changes to a sinister one. This is a very overlooked line that I've not seen many others talking about. What does my guy Onion San mean? Cameo on SCP-3922 I won't go on about what SCPs are, as most people familiar with icebergs are familiar with the fictional SCP Foundation, so I'll go into the actual SCP itself. SCP-3922 is a metal cylinder that, when placed near a TV or a computer, alters the fictional media being played on it. Actors wearing combat uniforms and gas masks, or SCP-399-A, usually appear to punish any crimes committed by the characters in the media. The Foundation tested the capabilities of SCP-3922 on various media, including Deltarune. I'll simply read directly what happened here. Subject, a recorded playthrough of Deltarune Chapter 1, 2019, Rated Teen. Interference point, when Chris sees Susie eating chalk. Result, an SCP-3922-A instance, rendered in the game's art style, appears to lecture Susie on bullying and eating non-edible items. Susie basically ignores this lecture. Chris and Susie still enter the abandoned classroom and still fall into the dark world. Notably, all plot taking place within the dark world is completely unchanged. After Susie and Chris emerge from the Dark World, the epilogue within the town is unchanged. 
except for the notable absence of Sans. Note, maybe SCP-3922-A didn't punish characters like the Chaos King and Jevil because they exist in a story within a story? Director Naismith. Question mark, question mark, question mark. If Chris's name is modified to be longer than six letters, then question mark, question mark, question mark will appear to the right of the menu. It's basically Deltarune's version of easy to change, huh? Patient. Patient is an earlier, unfinished version of another medium that was created for Homestuck. It's a remix of the track, Doctor. It's actually the song you're listening to right now. Flowey Scene Stalking. This is an unused variable hidden away in the game's data for how many times you catch Flowey stalking you. Axum Ranger Undyne. Very early designs of Undyne were said to be inspired by the Axum Rangers from Super Mario RPG. These sketches by Temi showcase this old design, and you can definitely see the inspiration. Toby also said he considered giving Undyne a, a realistic fish head, but no art of this exists, unfortunately. Undyne and Diary of a Wimpy Kid in the movie Diary of a Wimpy Kid Long Haul, there's a scene where a woman cosplaying as Underkeep Undyne shows up. For those unaware, Underkeep is an AU created by Rotodisc, and this is how she appears in that AU. The cosplayer in question, Athena Cosplay, had this to say, Thanks! I actually made this costume and I'm the person wearing it. They scouted me at Dragon Con to come and spend four days at a mock convention to end up in the film for five seconds. It was fun and I made money. The costume is based on Rotodisc's Underkeep fan art. Mew Smile Spectrogram. If Mew Smile, you know, this ear abomination. If that is put into a spectrogram, a weird symmetrical pattern appears. It's very hard to tell, but the middle seems to showcase a figure, possibly W.D. Gaster. It's also possible he's riding a horse of some kind, with arches behind him. Though this could all just be the mind tricking you trying to see a pattern. It's unknown if this was intentional or not, but either way, it's really fucking creepy. Gaster's theme is everywhere. I've briefly touched upon the fact that Gaster's theme is hidden in other songs before, but I never mentioned how deep it goes. This video by Media Motifs showcases over 10 songs with Gaster's theme hidden within them. Now some people debate against this by saying the main part of Gaster's theme is just a 4 note arpeggio, which are commonly used in songs to make things sound more interesting. However, consider the idea that Toby deliberately made Gaster's theme something so simple to add into music in order to create this idea that his theme is hidden across the entire game. You know how much Toby loves motifs, so this is definitely not out of the question. Sans knows about the Amalgamates. If you call Papyrus outside of Alphys' lab, this bit of dialogue plays out. Labradory? Does that mean there are dogs inside? I mean, I want to rule it out. As we know, there actually are dogs inside the lab, and Sans winking when he says he wouldn't rule it out is fairly suspicious. In the version 1.001 update, a new line was added to further hint at this idea. If you call Papyrus twice inside of the lab, he'll comment on the bag of dog food. Wait, that bag of dog food looks familiar. I remember seeing it in Sans's room? Yeah, I asked him why he had it. He told me he was trying to eat healthier. Considering it's highly possible Sans and Alphys work together, the idea of Sans helping with taking care of the amalgamates isn't out of the realm of possibility. What's incredibly interesting about the first phone call, you know, the one where Sans talks about dogs, is that it was the last phone call added to the game, as discovered by Reddit user Carabil Watar. Donkey Kong is my favorite Marvel superhero. This is a variable for the three switches puzzle in Hotland to prevent the text box from glitching out. 
Bit strange, innit? Vinyl Soundtrack Hidden Encounter The back of the vinyl soundtrack cover has an encounter with the vinyl soundtrack itself. Could it be a hidden encounter in game just waiting to be found? No. Asura In the Undertale art book, Toby explains the existence of Royal Guard 3 and Royal Guard 4 but also explains that all of the Royal Guards were going to have an amalgamated form named Asura. This amalgamate is interesting because the Royal Guards are more of characters that aren't really part of a clear species, unlike all the other amalgamates. It reminds me of a canon version of Six Bones in a way. Reaper Whimsalot In the art book, Whimsalot's early design is shown, where they have a skull-like face and a scythe. Mismatched Delta Room Clocks After Chris and Susie leave the Dark World, you can walk around the inside of the school after hours. In every single classroom, the clocks all have different times on them. This can mostly be explained. If you look at both classrooms, you can see that the Kindergarten classroom uses some of the same sprites, but flipped. It's possible this was done to the clock too, unknowingly, as the clock is exactly flipped with the clock in the first classroom. However, that leaves the clock in the closet, which has both hands pointing down. This time is impossible to be shown on a real clock, and this could be either explained away as the clock being broken, or some sort of symbolism. Both hands are pointed at 6, and Gaster's number motif is 666. Coincidence? Recolored Mold Smalls the Molt Smalls in Waterfall are a different color than the ones over in the Ruins, according to the check information. You can't tell this by the black and white sprites, but they are. Frisk is Chara's undead body. Now, it's quite clear that Chara possessed Frisk in some way, and at the end of Genocide, they explained they were revived from death. But what if we took this more literally? This is a massive crack theory, but I'll still explain it. Frisk, at least compared to Chara, looks... odd. Their eyes are always shut, they never talk, and their skin is a bright yellow compared to Chara's more natural pale skin. So is Frisk a zombie? Well, this could easily be explained away as a way to keep Frisk's appearance ambiguous, and the mere fact nobody recognizes you as Chara, aside from Flowey, explains this away too. And if Chara is meant to be Frisk, how do they change clothes entirely in Genocide? Core Meltdown Inconsistency So the core is cooled down by the Ice Wolf throwing ice into the water, where it travels to the core in order to be melted and cool off the core, right? So, why then does the core not have a meltdown in Genocide? Because the wolf doesn't throw ice for quite some time during then. Dentata Photoshop Flowey has an attack where multiple green virus-looking objects appear with mouths on them with pronounced teeth. In the game's files, these objects are named Dentata, the Latin word for teeth. However, most people know of the word Dentata from a folktale that describes a man trying to... forcibly have his way with a woman, only for her genitals to have teeth in them. Let's, uh, take a look at that attack one more time and, uh, yeah. Stray Pixel at King Fight There is a stray pixel in the background of the King's Fight. This game is literally fucking unplayable. Mr. Sunshine Mr. Sunshine is a character Toby doodled in the art book, which never got to appear in the final game. He looked like a lion with a crescent head and a sun for a tail. There are some other designs on this page, but they're not really noteworthy. However, I have to point out fan art of this character by Twitter user MonsterCandy28, which gives a very menacing look to this otherwise forgettable scribble. The Human in Sansa's Tarot Card Symbolism In Sansa's Tarot Card, the human can be spotted in the reflection on the hallway's window. What's interesting is that they're standing exactly where the angel is on the window. Is this meant to be subtle symbolism that the human is the angel in the prophecy? Muffet Saw Gaster Muffet mentions during her fight that the monster who hired her to kill you had a wonderful smile and change shape. Gaster's sprite has a smile and does change shape when you try and talk to him. However, I still believe that Metaton is the one who hired Muffet, as he has the money to pay out, and I 
don't believe a man that basically doesn't exist has a job. Mew Smile has Muffet's Laugh. If you take Mew Smile and intensely speed it up, you'll hear the laugh Muffet uses. Well, I could go all crackhead theory and say that this is definitive proof Muffet and Gaster are connected. Chances are, Toby found a way to reuse this sound bite and took it. This isn't even just Muffet's laugh either. It's used by other monsters in the core, like magic. Dweller's Empty Path Trio In Dweller's Empty Path, a game by Temi Chang, you can encounter three characters in a forest who all bear a resemblance to the fun gang in Deltarune. They tell the player they're looking for a fountain, but they can't find it. While the characters never tell you their names, their names are listed in the game's files. The characters' names are Chris, Zussi, and Larias. Chris is just one letter off from Chris, and Larias is an anagram for Razai. However, Zussi stands out, as her name is an anagram for Susie. Intentional or not, this points back to the idea that Susie is Susie in Undertale as this was an easter egg planted by someone who has worked closely on that game. Or it was just a way to make a cooler name. Cause these are's cools. Defeating Photoshop Flowey without the human souls. A strategy posed in the early days of Undertale was that you could kill Photoshop Flowey without hitting the act button at the end of each souls phase. If you actually try this, this makes the phase loop over and over again until you actually press the button. You can continue to use the fight button to damage Photoshop Flowey over and over again, but good luck actually defeating him this way. It was found that it actually is possible to defeat them this way with debug mode, but it'd likely take you many hours in vanilla gameplay considering how pathetic your damage output is during this time. Outside of this, could there be a canon way of defeating Photoshop Flowey without the Absorbed Souls working together with you? Azriel says Jaf during Chaos Saber Attack. There's a line that was supposedly unused that had Flowey say Jaf. Jaf! This sound effect is coded to play during Azriel's Chaos Saber Attack, but as soon as the sword swings, it turns off. Grievous error. I'm just gonna play the clip of this because I don't think I can even begin to explain what's happening. Empty space on right of True Pacifist start screen. There is a strange empty space on the right of the True Pacifist start screen, between Asgore and Monster Kid. What does this mean, Toby? WHAT DOES THIS MEAN?! See you in the next hell, losers! There's an unreachable line of dialogue in Deltarune's code that is found at the end of Rao Zai's old tutorial fight, which says, See you in the next hell, losers! This was likely added as a joke. Flowey mimics Shom's eye. During Flowey's speech, just before he goes all Photoshop mode on you, he morphs his face into three moving circles when talking about everyone. This could possibly be a reference to the Darkeners, as Shom's button eye bears a striking resemblance to Flowey's face here. Castle seen in Waterfall different than one in Ending. The castle seen in the distance in Waterfall has been theorized to be different from the one in New Home. For starters, there isn't a hint of the blue seen on the Waterfall Castle in New Home's castle. All of it seems colorless up until the Judgment Hall and the Throne Room. The interior of New Home also looks nothing like how the castle in Waterfall is set up to look like, as it looks like it has lots of entry points while New Home is basically just one long hallway. The location of the castle also doesn't make sense if you look at the whole map of the underground. New Home is much farther to the right than the castle in Waterfall is. This mystery has been solved though, as if you call Papyrus while in the Waterfall Castle room, he will say that is indeed Asgore's castle. 
Korean Demo. There's an official Korean demo available for installation on Undertale's official website. This version was built off an earlier version of the Undertale demo, as this version has remnants of earlier features such as Grandpa Semi. Azrael was abused by Chara. Okay, so, obviously, judging by the name of this entry, this goes into possibly triggering subjects. So if you want to avoid that kind of thing, skip to this timestamp in the video. So, Tumblr user No Chocolate proposes the theory that there are many hints within the game that Chara emotionally abused Azrael in many ways. Abuse is very subtle and can go unnoticed by even the victim, so going over these things one red flag at a time will paint a broader picture of what Chara's relationship with Azrael might have been like. For starters, there's a lot of hints that imply Chara shames Azrael for crying, such as when Azrael denies his own emotions in front of Chara and says, Big kids don't cry. This has likely happened before, but Azrael doesn't question it because Chara is Azrael's best friend, and their times spent together are fun, so there isn't a problem to him. Abusers are able to hide their intent very well, and this is merely one example of that. Flowey, aka Azrael, right before the final fight in True Pacifist, says he believes that the human, or who he believes to be Chara, manipulated the monsters into loving them. In Genocide, Flowey says himself that he manipulated people after he saw almost everything there was to see, and assumes that Chara must have done the same thing. After Azrael is given true love and comfort by Frisk, Azrael says, You aren't really Chara, are you? Only after Azrael realizes that Frisk is being genuine in their affection, he realizes they can't be Chara. When Chara fell underground, every single dreamer felt an obligation to help them out, as it seems Chara suffered through something in the past, considering their hatred for humanity. This gave a massive source of emotional leverage for Chara, as they could basically do whatever they wanted if they seemed hurt. Manipulators can only get help if they want help, and Chara, unfortunately, never seemed to want help. This meant that Chara kept manipulating Azrael because Azrael kept giving Chara what they wanted. They kept taking and taking and taking until there was nothing left to take. At the end of Genocide, Chara takes control and kills Flowey because there's nothing left that Chara wants from Azrael. Manipulators seek out new targets if they need one, and Frisk, a pacifistic and generous person, can be manipulated easily. When Chara mentions their plan to Azrael, he became understandably upset. He would have to have Chara die and absorb their soul. There was no way he was going to do that. However, upon saying he doesn't like the plan, Chara mentions that Azrael is crying. This is deflection. Chara changed the subject away from the real issue and towards Azrael's legitimate feelings, belittling him for feeling upset about this plan he's not comfortable with. After this, Azrael said, big kids don't cry. This is invalidation. This is common in victims, where they invalidate their own feelings in favor of agreeing with their abuser. In this case, Azrael agreed that he shouldn't cry, and didn't press any further about how upset the plan made him. There's proof that this has happened before between Azrael and Chara. When Azrael was upset about poisoning Asgore, Chara laughed it off, and later Azrael says he should have laughed it off too. This implies that Chara was making Azrael believe his reaction to this situation was irrational. When he talked to Azrael after his fight, he says, I always was a crybaby, wasn't I, Chara? This implies that crybaby was a common name that Chara called Azrael, a very demeaning name at that. One that would make Azrael lose his confidence and believe the names that Chara was calling him, to the point that Azrael calls himself a crybaby. This is name calling another manipulation tactic. Azrael later explains to Frisk what happened when he absorbed Chara and went to the human village. Frisk, when Chara and I combined our souls together, the control over our body was actually split between us. They were the one that picked up their own empty body. And then, when we got to the village, they were the one that wanted to use their full power. I was the one that resisted. This means that Chara wanted Azrael to kill a human, but Azrael did not want to do that, no matter what Chara said to him. 
When their words lost power, Shara used physical force to get their way. This was the only time we see Azriel defy Chara. In one of the tapes in True Lab, after Chara shames Azriel for crying, they asked if Azriel agreed with the plan. He said yes. After this, Azriel says, No, I'd never doubt you, Chara. Never. Even though Azriel agreed, Chara seemed to ask Azriel if he didn't trust them. Manipulators want to push the truth the victim already believes at any chance they can. After this, Chara says to Azriel that they'll free everyone, making Azriel believe that this plan would benefit other people, making him less likely to question it. The mere fact Chara was able to convince Azriel, a kind-hearted monster, into this plan shows their manipulation. They belittled Azriel's crying, convinced Azriel to go with his plan despite his intuition, and persuaded him until he saw that Chara's way was the right way. While it may sound ridiculous, many victims idolize their abusers, sometimes over their own family and friends. This happens with Azriel a lot. As Flowey, sometimes he sees Frisk as Chara, and his whole demeanor changes. While Frisk is a puppet he can easily toy and mess around with, Chara is his best friend. He brings up Chara unprompted, speaks highly of them, and when he realized he couldn't feel love as a flower, the love he said he could have gotten from Chara, he wanted to kill himself. His devotion to Chara was so great that he doesn't want to live in a world without them. In Genocide, Flowey says that Chara is the only one that understands him, and that they won't give him worthless pity. This seems contradictory, but to Azriel's manipulated mind, there's nothing wrong with this. Azriel says something similar during True Pacifist. He only wants to reset the timeline to be with Chara forever. This unwavering dedication to someone is common with victims. After the event of the plan going wrong, and both Azriel and Chara getting killed, Azriel blamed himself for what happened, despite everything being Chara's plan. Putting the blame on oneself and never on the abuser is another sign of manipulation. Flowey explains that, despite making the right decisions as Azriel, his life was full of suffering. He wishes he could go back and stop being such a caring person, and thinks that Chara's way was the right way after all, and it's his fault that he's now a flower. If you abort a genocide route and then perform a neutral route, Flowey questions your behavior, asking you why you screwed it up like last time. However, Flowey tries to rationalize this. They could kill every other monster that stood in their way, but no way that they would hurt Asriel. Flowey pushes this narrative onto himself until he believes it. This is a denial tactic that's common in victims. Speaking of genocide, Char kills Asriel at the end. But right before that, Flowey helped you on your genocide, and constantly referred to us and we when talking to him about your slaughter. When Flowey is faced with the undeniable truth that Chara will kill him, he asks for mercy. He desperately wants to believe that Chara will treat him differently than everyone else. Victims believe their abuser will treat them differently, assuming they're of more importance to them and wanting exclusive treatment. At the end of the Drew Pacifist route, Azriel says something that's hard for any abuse victim to say. Chara wasn't really the greatest person. He says that he wishes he had a friend like Frisk instead, and that he was spending his time with the wrong person. Later, Flowey begs you not to reset, talking to you like you're Chara. Let Frisk live their life. He's assuming that Chara is going to hurt Frisk, and even believes that they've done it before. Before, Flowey wouldn't have seen any flaws in Chara. Now he realizes they can be selfish and uncaring. He's come to terms with the fact that Chara was not a good person, but he still has positive memories and experiences with Chara deep down. I'll end this off with an excerpt from No Chocolate. Flowey's symptoms of being emotionally abused didn't begin in the genocide route. Even before Flowey recognizes Chara in the pacifist route, the red flags are still there, present in the neutral endings and lab tapes. Flowey's perception of Chara stems from how Chara treated him while he was alive as Azriel. The evidence for Azriel's abuse is not obvious. Flowey's behavior is subtle, and the red flags are present but small enough to easily brush off, just like in real life. He doesn't ask for sympathy because most of the time he doesn't realize there's a problem. When he does start to acknowledge it, he is accountable for his own actions. He isn't interested in making excuses. That's typically what abusers do. Resist the misconception that a victim must appear weak, 
innocent, and blameless. All too often, abuse is invisible, even to the person being abused. Whew! Alright, enough actually depressing shit. Let's get back into the less serious. Pressing all three Hotland switches. There's a glitch that allows you to hit all three Hotland switches in a row, which you're not allowed to do normally. This has... this happen. However, not many people know that there is actually cut dialogue for this scene hidden within the code. Temi one-hit killing after refusing to sell the shopkeeper. There was a rumor in the early days of Undertale that the Temi enemy one-shots you after you refuse to sell to the Temi shopkeeper. While this would have been an amazing secret, it's sadly not true. I'm not sure exactly where or how this rumor would have started, but it definitely feels like a do trust me my dad works in Nintendo type of rumor. Lancer and Susie's Blueprints and the Workshop's Blueprints when Lancer and Susie are creating the Thrash Machine, they temporarily hang up some blueprints. These look incredibly similar to the blueprints in Sansa's workshop. And also remember when the Thrash Machine gets destroyed before it even activates? Well, do you also remember the covered up machine in the workshop? That machine is said to be broken too. And also, the Don't Forget note is highly thought to be linked to the Fun Gang, so it seems the connections between this workshop and Deltarune are becoming tied closer and closer together. Shom's theme in PS4 launch trailer. Shom's theme, Lantern, is in the first few beginning seconds of the Undertale PS4 launch trailer. This is strange, considering Deltarune wasn't even announced at the time. The ruins are a cemetery for dead monsters. When Toriel tells you to follow her, she says, I will guide you through the catacombs. If you don't know, catacombs are underground cemeteries. And also keep in mind that Chara's grave is possibly at the beginning of the ruins. And Toriel later tells you that some areas are dusty. You know, monster remains. This fact basically makes Toriel a groundskeeper for a massive grave site, and I don't know how to feel about that. Toriel faking her death. If you perform a genocide hard mode run and kill Toriel, the annoying dog will interrupt you like normal, and Toriel will get up like nothing happened and leaves to bake another pie. While this is obviously non-canon and just a joke, it's still a little confusing. Undyne found it at the bay. When you check the pirate flag in Papyrus's room, Papyrus will say, Isn't that flag neato? Undyne found it at the bay. This implies there's a beach area in the underground that we just never get to see, and no one else mentions it outside of this one line of dialogue. Box Puzzle Unused Cutscene there's an unused cutscene for the box puzzle in the Field of Hopes and Dreams, where, instead of doing the puzzle like a normal person, Susie fucking SMASHES DOWN THE GATE WITH THE BOXES TO PROGRESS. I'll play the cutscene in full here. The Dark, The Return, The Death. Deltarune's window title changes depending on where you're at in the game progress-wise. Here's a list of all of them and when they appear. Contact, in the Vessel Creation intro. The Beginning, when you're in the Surface World. The Dark, when you're in the Dark World. The Death, on the Game Over screen. 
and the return upon returning to the surface world. Notice how some are capitalized and some aren't. Could the capitalized ones be Gaster? And does that mean he's representing the dark? And if he is the narrator, then who is the other one that uses proper capitalization? Asriel and Demo Files In May of 2013, the Undertale demo was released. Within the files, the names of characters were discovered through the file names, including Asriel with the file name BG Asriel Room. Other characters present in the files include Grandpa Semi, who I mentioned before on the last iceberg, Dr. Alphys, Undyne, yes it's spelled that way, Metaton, and Asgore. No music in Papyrus's room. This is simply a strange detail nobody seems to point out. There's no music in Papyrus' room. At all. Everywhere else in the Bone Brothers' house, there's music, and not many other rooms in Undertale have no music. Normally, no music is meant for serious areas, meant to build up atmosphere, but this is Papyrus' room. I, I don't think it needs that kind of tension. Needle cookie. And now we have yet another entry that might be triggering to some people. This goes over some serious topics, so if you want to skip this entry, there will be a timestamp on screen. Okay, here we go. On May 10th, 2017, Tumblr artist Avi Medes was at a convention when she was offered a cookie by a fan. Without thinking much of it, she took it and ate it. And a needle pierced her tongue. Had this needle actually entered her system, it could have possibly killed her. Avi Medes would later post about this encounter, saying she couldn't find out who gave her the cookie, and she lost a lot of trust in people giving her sweets from that point on. It was speculated that the reason Avi Medes was nearly murdered was because of her ship. She drew lots of fan art of Frisk and Sans, and a lot of people consider that ship Billy Fred. Now, people have taken the story as 100% truth, when there's no actual evidence to say this attempted murder was because of Undertale shipping. It was only speculation, no clear-cut answer. Even if the story happened because of Undertale ships, don't fucking do this. And check any food you're given to by strangers. Whatever you think of Frisk X Sands or ships like it, don't use it as a reason to murder someone. I, I can't believe I have to say this, but... That's the world we live in. The second voice. So, it's agreed upon that the speaker during the vessel-making sequence is Gaster, right? They talk like him, and he's linked to all of Deltarune, so, obviously, that's the case. Well, this might not be the case. The Japanese language is a lot different than English, as there's non-gendered pronouns that refer to connotations, such as formal and casual speech. In the Japanese translation of Undertale, all of the characters speak in a casual, childish tone. Except for Chara. They speak with the formal, mature tone, which is a jarring contrast to the rest of the characters in the game. Fitting. So why do I bring this up? Well, in the Japanese translation of Deltarune, while making your vessel, the speaker's tone is very awkward, to say the least. It uses syntax and structure that's never used in Japanese, and makes the speaker's tone seem jumbled and confusing. This person can be assumed to be Gaster, considering he usually speaks in wingdings. When the vessel is discarded, the entire scene takes a sharp turn. The speaker no longer speaks in the strange way. They speak in a formal tone. The exact tone Shara speaks in Undertale. Also consider the scene around this new speaker. All of the hints to Gaster are gone, no music is playing, and you're left on a black screen with white text. Doesn't that sound familiar? Even more so, this speaker talks with proper capitalization as compared to the first speaker who spoke in all uppercase letters. There's more that can be inferred from the fact that Shara is a major part of Deltarune's story as they were the one that stripped you of your freedom at the beginning. But I'll leave the full theory by Reddit user Reptoid Ryu in the comments, as I just wanted to go over the major fact that Chara is speaking in Deltarune's intro. Castle Town is fake. The town you first encounter Rousai in, Castle Town, is empty. Isn't that a little strange? Rousai is supposedly a prince, and yet he has no one to rule over. All of the houses are locked, and there's no proof anyone lives in this town whatsoever. 
There's no mention of this town anywhere after you leave it, too. Raozai never mentions it either, not even if anyone lived there before. So what is up with this ghost town? Well, if we go back to the theory that Raozai has some sort of evil intent, it's possible that Raozai created this village as a ploy to prove to Chris and Susie he really is a prince. Maybe it's a stretch, but there's really no good explanation to what happened to this town, given the little information we know. What happened to Grilby? In Deltarune, Grilby's can be found as a place run by Sans. But what exactly happened to it? A majority of the sign is scratched off and rewritten to say Sans instead. But where did it come from? And more importantly, what happened to Grilby? Nobody makes a mention of him in the entire game. Not even Sans, who owns what was supposedly his old bar. Inaccessible Balcony To the right of Sans of Papyrus' house, there seems to be an inaccessible balcony. Maybe Sans' room was designed at first to have an entrance to this balcony? YouTube Undertale Disbelief Demo Mislabeling Undertale is commonly mislabeled by YouTube Gaming as the demo for Undertale Disbelief. It's not really known why this happens, and how Undertale Disbelief got recognized as a game by YouTube itself, but I guess that means the fan game makers did a good job. It was as if it was never there at all. If you go into the save file menu before completing Deltarune's main story, the menu design will be far more simple, and it seems that the voice narrating the menu is the same as the vessel creation section, so it wouldn't be unreasonable to say it's Gaster. One thing worth pointing out is the dialogue you get after erasing the save file. The voice will say, It was as if it was never there at all. This parallels Gaster's situation, where one day you're here, and the next you're gone. As if you were never there to begin with. Nintendo taking down Megalovania cover. Sometime in December 2018, Nintendo took down a fan-made cover of Megalovania in the style of Super Smash Bros. Initially, people in the Smash speculation community took this as just another weird decision by Nintendo, as stuff like this happening isn't exactly new, even if it's not fair. However, some people thought this meant something more, that Undertale was coming to Smash, and Megalovania would be in the game. Well, they were right. Metaton Morse Code A rumor floating around for some time was that there was Morse code spoken by Metaton hidden in the files of Undertale. If you translated this Morse code, it would take you to an image link of Flowey calling you a naive idiot. It was revealed that this was a hoax created by a fan. There is no hidden Morse code in the files. Gaster Hates PS4 Rather than bringing you back to the title screen upon typing Gaster on the PS4 version, it straight up crashes the game. This wasn't intentional. Unused Vulcan Fight in Trailer There is an unused fight with two Vulcans present in every Undertale trailer, besides the Xbox One. Side note, this may be what's left of the unused cheerleader monster that was shown in the art book. When the cheerleader monster was supposed to spawn, two Vulcan would spawn with them, and the text that's included when you encounter the Vulcan says, A strange parade blocks the path. Unlisted Fwug Radiation Videos Toby Fox has a few unlisted videos on his channel, most of them related to Homestuck. Unfortunately, all of them have recently been privated due to dumb YouTube rules. However, I'll show probably my favorite one right here, named Garf Zone. Gee, some people enjoy a little music in the morning. Origin of Photoshop Flowey Face 
The source of this Photoshop flowy face has always been casually accepted as Toby Fox, but this was never confirmed. No unedited pictures of Toby Fox exist that could line up, and nobody who worked on Undertale has said where the faces originate from. An alternate theory for the face's origins is from the Tally Hall music video Banana Man, due to the eyes, the head shape, and the way the head moves on the characters in the music video. While it's not an exact match, it's also not out of the question that these shots could have been heavily edited. Decline of Deltarune AUs Undertale's fandom is infamously known for its alternate universes. This is a very common talking point when it comes to fandoms and making jokes comparing this game to Friday Night Funkin'. However, Deltarune has not seen this explosion of AUs like Undertale has. In fact, there's barely any. There's more Undertale AUs being created daily than Deltarune AUs in general. So what's the deal? Well, Deltarune is only a demo. Only one part to a five part game we can only speculate the plot of. If this iceberg is of any indication, there's so many mysteries to what's even going on within Deltarune's world. The game is simply incomplete. Compare this to Undertale, which is a full game with the story entirely revolving around the idea of alternate timelines. It's fairly easy to take this fluid plot and change aspects of it to create a whole new universe. Maybe when Deltarune fully releases, we'll see more AUs. But for now, we have Delta Swap, I guess. Real Knife Based on Demo Hoax in June of 2013, days after the release of the Undertale demo, Toby took to Tumblr regarding some rumors he had heard. I'll read the post here. Real Knife Apparently some person on TV Trope started a rumor about this. There's no such thing. This is a game for all ages, after all. I just hate to watch people waste time trying to get something that isn't there. So, if I'm getting this situation right, Toby heard about the Real Knife rumors going around and decided to add it to the final game just because? It is pretty cool how it's basically an official urban legend. Flowey based on Godzilla NES Creepypasta In the Undertale art book, Toby states that Flowey is based on Face, a character from the Godzilla NES Creepypasta. Face is a character that has an innocent appearance at first, before eventually backstabbing the author later on. Sound familiar? Face is also known for, well, his faces, something that Flowey is known for as well. Smell the pain. Reddit user 4glory99 came across something incredibly strange. He was delivering the letter to Alphys and tried to find the other side of her lab to slide the letter under the other door. He didn't realize it, but that area is locked out at this point in the game, so he was wandering aimlessly for a while. Eventually, he came across this Vulcan in one of Metaton's rooms. He talked to the Vulcan, and after it gave dialogue like usual, it actually gave him a prompt to slide the letter under it. He decided fuck it and slid the letter under the Vulcan. Then, this came up. Smell the pain. After this, the Vulcan said so spicy endlessly. So what the hell is going on here? A deleted Reddit user commented on 4glory99's thread with how they were able to further mess with this glitch. Drop Undyne's first letter. Slide the second letter under Vulcan. Go back and talk to Undyne. The letters stayed in my inventory. However, I found out that Vulcan repeats whatever was said to you last, including decisions, which is why the bug appears in the first place. So that's essentially how the glitch worked, but where the hell did smell the pain come from? There's an unused room named Test Room, I know, very creative, and this dialogue is present in the room. La la, time to wake up and smell the pain, though it's still a little shaky. <laughs> this line will show up when the game it tells itself to say specific dialogue, but it can't find it. So that's about it to this mystery. It's simply a very, very strange glitch that managed to sneak its way into a relatively glitchless game. But it definitely read like a real-life creepypasta, huh? Every man is the knight. Buckle up, kiddos. This is a long one. We've discussed every man before, but we still don't know that much about him. However, we have a decent idea as to what his role could be. Tumblr user VGFM proposes the theory that every man is the knight. Yes, that knight. The one who has caused so much trouble in the dark world and is implied to be the main antagonist in the future. Let's go over simpler evidence first. 
Every man's file name is Strange Man, and when we first hear of the knight from Shom, he calls him a strange knight. Nearly every time the word strange is used, it's used to describe either the knight or Jevil, so Strange Man is definitely a candidate for the knight. Speaking of Jevil, the carousel attack having every man appear has been established, but Jevil also acknowledges the knight once you defeat him. This is interesting, since Shom said Jevil was imprisoned long before the knight overthrew the kings. A possible theory is that the strange someone Jevil met before he was locked up was in fact the knight, especially considering the use of the word strange. As to why Jevil seemed to go insane after talking to the knight, it's possible the knight tried to use Jevil to destabilize Card Castle, but eventually he overthrew the kings himself, meaning Jevil was a failed attempt to overthrow the kings. Now let's talk about the Spade King. It's clear that the two are close, as the knight was the one who installed the Spade King into Card Castle in the first place. While the Spade King's attacks never make a direct reference to Everyman's design, there is one detail most have overlooked. When Spade King is defeated, his cape flies away like a butterfly. Now, who else has been associated with butterflies before? Maybe a certain strange man? While well, some might argue this butterfly attack is only here because of Whimsalod's attack, who is part of the Reaper Bird amalgamate, the sprites used for every man's attack are different, and the file name for his butterflies are Strange Man Butterflies, meaning that every man is directly associated with these butterflies. Now, let's go back to Reaper Bird for a second. Reaper Bird is an amalgamate of Astagmatasm, Final Froggit, and Whimsalot. These characters always stood out in a strange way. Despite these characters appearing in the core, the most high-tech location in Undertale, they have a medieval theming, consisting of wizards and knights. What you could argue, oh, they're part of the Royal Guard, that's why they look like knights. But no, you're wrong. They're mercenaries, unaffiliated with Asgore and the Royal Guard. It's just very strange that knight-themed characters appear in this location, and that every man is a part of them due to the Reaper Bird. Even in the Undertale art book, every man is shown off with the other core monsters. This has to be intentional. Now, you might be thinking, seriously? This guy is going to be the knight? This Pillsbury Doughboy looking motherfucker? Well, every man has only been seen as a bullet and as graffiti, which are both always very simplified from the main designs, so his full design will probably look different. Random tidbit, but there's an attack where every man tosses multiples of his head at the player. Well, what if that's not his head, but a helmet? A knight's helmet. Okay, now there might be some people who believe otherwise that Gaster is the knight. While Gaster is definitely second in line for the knight's spot, there are connections we can go over between every man and Gaster. Just keep in mind that this is so speculative. We're going over the most obscure characters that haven't even canonically appeared on screen in full yet. So, every sprite name that ends with man, besides a snowman, is a sprite for a mysterious character that ties back to either Gaster or Everyman. Riverman, or a river person, ties into Gaster, Darkman, or the core mercenaries, tie into Everyman, and so does Watching Man, a character similar to the Amalgamates, aka where we first see Everyman. And outside of Undertale, we have a man from Deltarune. The use of the word man always seems very deliberate, always referring to a mysterious character linked to Gaster or Everyman. Now this line here, the remaining king put him and his strange son into power, is a bit weird grammatically, but it can be interpreted as the fact that Knight has a strange son. This can be linked to Gaster, as he is theorized to have two sons. It's possible either Gaster or Everyman is the knight, and the other one is the strange son. It doesn't really matter who's who, because the two characters are very deeply connected. Now, how can these two possibly be related? They're not even the same species from the looks of things. Well, Gaster's a scientist. He could easily create Everyman, making Everyman his son born from science. There's also the more out there theory that Everyman created Gaster. The knight is creating dark fountains, which give form to the darkeners, as seen in Ralsei's manual. And Gaster, a character associated with the dark, could be a darkener, making Gaster the sun to every man. Now, here's the last thing to mention about every man, and it's easily the most out there thing. Every character in the dark world seems to have a light world counterpart. 
So who would every man's variation be? The ICE employees. No, I'm not joking. Let's look at the Everyman Graffiti again. There's ICE, right there. We don't know the people underneath the mascot costumes, meaning they could look like every man underneath the costumes. Remember the warrior? Well, for one, he certainly acts strange as hell, and second, he mentions the medical staff are white wizards, which fits the knight theme of every man and the core monsters. It's important to note that the warrior is a massive LARPer. He never drops the act at all. His whole mind is warped by a fantasy. Well, here's something interesting. There's a dark man in the core who says this. As a youth, I would sneak out to play by this creepy flaming pit. Since the core is always rearranging, it was like a game trying to find it. This seems to imply that the mercenaries are a lot younger than they seem. They were kids when the core was around. Maybe they're LARPers too. Going back to the warrior real quick, he's in the hospital due to pizza-related injuries. Well, what if it wasn't exactly pizza-related? There are some torn-up banners in the throne room that implied there was a struggle. Maybe the knight was here while overthrowing the kings. Speaking of the hospital, the screenshots of Chapter 2 seem to imply we're going to a hospital setting. Noelle also seems to have a lot of importance, and it makes sense that Noelle will be at the hospital if shit hits the fan with Rudy. Whew, that was a lot to go over. The original post somehow goes into more detail, so props to VGFM for their original post. It'll be linked in the description. So, to summarize, Everyman is likely the knight due to both characters being referred to as strange, both are related to Gaster, both are related to Jevil, and both are related to knights and medieval imagery. Everyman could likely be an ICE employee known as the Warrior, who seems to live in a fantasy world. The employee is in the hospital, and the Deltarune Chapter 2 seems to have some hospital theme to it. Deltarune Currency Cover-Up At the bake sale in Deltarune's forest, the shopkeepers say items cost a certain number of G. If you don't remember, G, or gold, isn't the currency in Deltarune. It's actually dark dollars, and indicated by the typical dollar sign, not a G. This was patched out in the console versions to say D as opposed to G, indicating this was an error on Toby's part. When you create a game world this massive, you're bound to make small slip-ups here and there, and people will speculate the hell out of tiny details like this, so it's nice that Toby fixed this clear typo. Naming Yourself Quote This is a fake easter egg created by Reddit user NiceRatops, which shows off what happens when you name Frisk Quote. This is one of the first of its kind, so it's nice to look back on something like this. Shouldn't proceed yet. During Genocide Route, if you try to leave Waterfall to fight Undyne without killing every monster in the area, you'll be stopped in your tracks as the narrator states, Strongly felt a number of monsters left. Shouldn't proceed yet. Considering the red text, this means Chara is explicitly telling the player they need to kill more monsters, and will not allow you to move on until you do so. The power Chara gains from Genocide really corrupts them. Has a brother named Comic Sans and a blank named Blank. On the pic showcasing Papyrus' beta design is a section that reads, Has a brother named Comic Sans and a blank named Blank. This sticks out like a sore thumb in the image due to the fact it's censored with large black bars. Why doesn't Toby want us to know about this? If you remember Grandpa Semi, that might be the character being redacted here, making the full quote, has a brother named Comic Sans and a grandfather named Semi. Toby has never publicly talked about Grandpa Semi, so censoring his name makes sense. One last side note, it's interesting that Sans was going to be fully named Comic Sans. Guess Sans rolls off the tongue better. Gaster's disappearance sound is Gaster's theme. As shown in a video by Media Motifs, if you take the Mystery Man's disappearance sound and loop, reverse, and slow it down, it sounds a lot like Gaster's theme. More evidence to support the already solid theory that the Mystery Man is, in fact, Gaster. <laughs> Sync Theory This is probably the most out there theory on this iceberg, but it's so crazy it might actually be true. 
In Deltarune's hospital, there are two short sinks in one room that the narrator comments that there might have originally been one tall sink that split apart to create both of them. Believe it or not, people think it's an analogy for something. One theory suggests that it's talking about Frisk and Chara combining to form Chris. Look at their sprite sizes. It's not hard to see that Chris is taller than both of them. Another theory is that the two sinks are Sans Papyrus and the tall one is Gaster. It would fit the other theory that Gaster split apart into the Skeleton Brothers. Gaster's sprite is also taller than both of them too. Megalovania almost didn't happen. In The Making of Radiation's Halloween Hack, Toby said that Megalomania from Live A Live was going to be used as Dr. Andonuts' boss theme originally, but he never got around to it. Toby said he instead yelled whatever he felt like into a microphone and copied it down to create Megalovania. Toby's choice to not use Megalomania was definitely the right choice in the end. Imagine the world without... <laughs> Napstablook born in 1922. This theory stems from Napsbluk's username on Undernet, Napsbluk22. As gone over with Papyrus and Undyne, a common practice when choosing your username is having your birth year in some form included. So for going off this, the Napsbluk was born in 1922 or 2022. However, I believe Napsbluk was born in 1922. Napsbluk runs the snail farm and says their main customer disappeared one day, and there is only one character this could apply to. Toriel. She lists off snail facts, eats snail pie, she's quite clearly crazy for snails. Toriel did suddenly disappear one day when she left for the ruins to isolate herself after her children's deaths. Napsablook also mentions that some hairy guy shows up once a month. This is likely Asgore, as he does have containers of snails in his fridge and would likely buy some in memory of Toriel. So, if Blooky recognizes Toriel as a frequent customer and notices her disappearance, she would have to have been buying snails before Chara and Asriel died. And combined with the username Napsablook22, this implies Napsablook was born in 1922. How are ghosts born, anyways? True Lab Power Source In the dark depths of the True Lab is a machine that on first glance, seems to be powered by a human soul. However, lots of evidence points to the fact that this isn't the case, because it's said by flavor text that this only powers the elevators. And if there was a human soul in their possession, why wouldn't they, you know, have broken the barrier already? It's just very strange that this bright red heart design is used for this, both in-universe and from a narrative perspective. In-universe, this is to power an elevator. It doesn't need this fancy design. And from a narrative perspective, it's odd that the epitome of a human soul design is used to represent something that is not a human soul. Unless I'm wrong, and Alphys has some even darker secrets to her name. Snowden Banner Disappearing After you kill Sans, if you backtrack to Snowden, the welcome sign is entirely missing. There's still collision as if the sign was there, but you can't read it. If this is a bug, how does this even occur? Well, considering the fact that Sans told you he was going to Grillby's, maybe he took the sign? But for what? To bring with him to another world? This one is so weird, dude. Undertale can tell when you're recording. Some players thought that the monologue Flower gives you near the end of the genocide route is proof that Undertale records you. This isn't true, however. It's a byproduct of people watching Let's Plays and not actually playing the game for themselves. Quantum Egg Theory Okay, listen. I'm not a physics professor, and honestly, I don't have the knowledge or time to summarize all of this effectively. This is a theory proposed by Reddit user AuraOff, and I'll leave a link to this theory in the description. I'll read the TLDR, but I implore you to read the full thing in the description. The egg is an item given by Gaster, with some special properties that are strongly related to quantum superposition. The egg is located in a combination of several places, and can be seen at one of them upon observation. It is very likely that someone infers on the egg's final location, as it can remain permanently on a location. 
On a same note, the fun also seems to be based on quantum superposition, through the many worlds interpretation, as its fun timelines represent different branches of the universe with equal chances to appear and collide with our timeline, resulting in fun events. Gaster and co. are most likely the ones behind the egg's odd behavior, as some of them are hinted to have some knowledge or expertise on quantum physics. Finally, the egg is also a message in Wingdings, possibly hinting at the knight's true identity. Inverted Deltarune on Toriel's House The Deltarune above Toriel's house has the three triangles facing the other way than they were originally. Although this is the only area in the game you can find this, you can also find this in the last corridor above the entryways in Undertale. The egg from Papyrus's date is the same one in Deltarune. This detail is a strange one. Why exactly is there an egg during Papyrus' date? Well, could it be related to the egg in Deltarune? I mean, Gaster is possibly related to Papyrus, so... I mean, there are other instances of eggs in Undertale and Deltarune, but this one sticks out to me. I don't know what it is. Nightmare Night leitmotif. Once again, talking about Cucumber Quest. Toby Fox created a track for Cucumber Quest labeled Nightmare Night that has the original leitmotif that's later used in The World Revolving. Media Motifs made a video on this, and I'll play a short snippet here. Evil Toriel. In the Undertale art book is a page with this sprite of Toriel with an evil smirk. Toby said this about it. Azriel's adult boss form was actually inspired by a program I made to test visual effects that I put an image of Toriel with evil eyes onto it. I don't know why I gave her evil eyes, but it looks so cool I felt like I had to do it in the actual game. Object Fake Froggit. This object is the froggit that you first encounter before the spike path in the demo. It's different from the other froggets for some reason. Maybe it has to do with the cutscene that plays after your turn? And why does it say fake in the name? Is it not an actual froggit? PS3 port. A user by the name of Nick on the Underminers Discord server once made a working PS3 port for Undertale. It wasn't done on physical hardware, but an emulator, but it does have screenshots to prove his existence. Big Wiener Zone in Hall of Failure. <laughs> okay, you heard that right. The Big Wiener Zone and Hall of Failure were areas designed for the playtesters to test bullet patterns for Metaton. We don't know much about it besides this, as it seems most of the code for it was dummied out before release, unfortunately. You're really eager to die, aren't you? Some unused dialogue used in an encounter with Undyne goes as follows. Give up your soul, or I'll tear it from your body. And then you get an option of yes or no. That spark in your eyes. You're really eager to die, aren't you? Gallery reversed is Gaster's theme. Gallery from Deltarune sounds pretty normal, but it feels like it's hiding something. If you reverse it, this is what it sounds like. Gaster is everywhere. Unused sprites in Cross Stitch Book. Yeah, there's an Undertale Cross Stitch Book. This is news to me. In the book are a lot of typical sprites you'd expect to find, but also some original sprites made for the book, such as this space background when you're feeling like trash with Bluki. There's also some officially colored battle sprites available to Cross Stitch, but a note says, these colored battle sprites aren't canon, but it might be fun to stitch if you get tired of just black and white. Damn it, nothing can be canon anymore. Though there is one unused sprite that's placed in the book. This snowman sprite. This appears in the game's files, but this is the first time it's ever officially used. Named Redacted in Credits. In the credits of Undertale, sticks out a strange name from a Kickstarter backer. Name Redacted. 
Someone specifically requested to be named this, and you know what? I vibe with it. Gaster Blasters on Hotland Doors. This is very hard to tell, but on certain doors in Hotland is this glowing design that resembles a one-eyed Gaster Blaster. Considering we're in Hotland, which is near the core, the Gaster Blaster symbol makes sense. Deltarune line stickers give future plot details. There's a set of line stickers for Deltarune, which has typical designs to them that you'd expect out of a sticker set. However, some of the designs in the stickers feel... too specific. For example, there's one sticker of Noelle running with a piece of toast in her mouth, and Susie is in the background, implying Noelle is going to run into her in the typical anime schoolgirl fashion. There's another sticker of Noelle looking down and asking, Are you okay? while offering a candy cane. This could be a sequel to the previous sticker, with Noelle helping Susie back up after they bump into each other. Now, you could probably just brush this off, it's a ship tease and nothing more, but what about this sticker? Noelle is cast in shadows and kneeling while saying, that that's not like you. Seriously, I have no idea what this sticker is for other than give away a part of the plot. Noelle doesn't say this, and if she does, it's not in this dramatic way. And besides, how are you supposed to use this in a conversation? This is for such an oddly specific moment in a possible conversation that it just feels like more like the artist wanted to tease out a future plot detail. I swear, if Chris even lays a hand on Noelle. There are other stickers, but they aren't as relevant as the one I just discussed. There is this sticker of Razai singing Don't Forget, possibly implying he's the singer behind Don't Forget. That's about it. True Lab Walls Laughing In the art book, Toby showcases a mock-up of a sequence of where the walls would shift in the faces and laugh at you. Toby cut this for being, well, too scary or too cheesy. Either or, I don't know how I would have reacted to this while I played the True Lab at 3am. Toriel's Eyes Result of Kickstarter Promos it's not very well known since it blends in so well in the sprite, but Toriel's eyes are a very, very dark shade of brown. It's not known why this was kept in, as no other natural eye color exists in a battle sprite, and colored in sprites are very, very rare in general. In the cross stitch mentioned earlier, Toriel's eyes are kept black, not their actual shade of brown. So are the brown eyes a mistake? Maybe they are. On the Kickstarter page for Undertale are these headings for different sections of the game, which shows a talking Toriel sprite, along with Toriel reading the book to Frisk on the right. Notice how Toriel's sprite is colored here. A deep shade of brown. The shade of brown used on the Kickstarter Toriel is the exact same shade of brown used on Toriel's eyes. So there's two possibilities here. Toby colored Toriel with this brown that forgot to make her eyes black, or he used the sprite specifically to color pick what color Toriel's eyes should be. Prove to me that you are. Hey, let me finish. There's a line of dialogue that can't be normally triggered in the game. The requirements to see it is that you need to have 11 kills in the ruins and 11 kills in Snowden before you fight Toriel. Yeah, you see the problem here? The line Toriel says before the fight says, Prove to me that you are, hey, let me finish, and then the fight begins. The way the text is coded makes it so that the second line of, hey, let me finish, is automatically cut off by the beginning of the fight without the player prompting it. It's possible that this was meant to be included during a genocide route, where it would start to show that the human can start fights without player input early on in the story. However, the statement, more than 11 kills in Snowden, makes it so that the scene never triggers. Was this intentional to make the scene go unused? Who knows. Differences in Deltarune save files. The three different save files in Deltarune are just so slightly different. In what way? Azrael's drawer. Checking Azrael's drawer gives a different result depending on the save file you're playing. The top save file says the drawer has a school cross country shirt with a tear in it. The middle save file says the drawer has a very old school ID with an embarrassing haircut. And the bottom save file says the drawer has a coupon book. Every coupon is for half off a large pizza. All the coupons expired before the book's print date. This seems very insignificant, but the mere fact this even exists means a lot. What could this mean for the future of Deltarune? Will your save file determine what outcomes happen in the plot? There's nothing to say for sure in this case, but this detail was put in here deliberately. There must be a reason for it. 
Trouble Boys and Scarlet Forest. In the Undertale art book, two characters named Trouble Boys are listed. These are obviously characters that never made it in the final game. Or were they? In Scarlet Forest and Deltarune, you can encounter a tiny pink ball character, who looks incredibly similar to the ball Trouble Boy, down to the lines on its head. Mold's Maul using Froggit's attack. Mold's Maul has a 4.5% chance to use Froggit's fly attack. Other monsters can reuse others' attacks in rare cases too, like Doggo using Snowdrake's attack. Flowey knows about the Darkeners. Remember when I mentioned earlier that Flowey imitated Shom's eye? Well, this seems to imply that Flowey knows about the Darkeners. Note what he says beforehand. Monsters. Humans. Everyone. Who is everyone in this scenario? It seems to imply there's beings other than humans and monsters in Undertale's world. Well, there might be a Darkener living in the underground. One Flowey is quite familiar with. A smiley trash bag. Undertale deleting itself after completing Genocide. Originally, the .exe file for Undertale would delete itself after you complete Genocide, hinted at by some unused code. It seems Toby didn't know what combination of uppercase and lowercase letters would work, so he just did every single combo he could think of. This fact is particularly interesting, however. This basically implies that the file for Undertale itself is the universe the characters are living in, and when the world is destroyed, so would the file. Of course, this isn't the case anymore, but it's food for thought. Gerson knew too much. Gerson was a wise fellow in Undertale. His old age made him know of things almost no one else does. To quote Gerson, I've been around a long time, maybe too long. During Genocide, if he threatened Gerson, he says this, I've lived too long to be afraid of something like you. Try it, kiddo. I know you can't here. Waha. Knowledge like that is the only reason I've survived so long. This means he's aware of the fact he's an NPC that can't be hurt, and that supposedly helped him survive. Well, where is he in Deltarune? He's dead. And his grave has a chip in it, implying he's been dead for a long time. So what happened to him? Maybe this might be out there, but it's possible that his knowledge about the world led him to being killed by a superior, like Gaster or Chara, simply for knowing too much. Snowden Fog Hidden Gaster Blaster The fog right before you fight Papyrus seems to have a secret on its sprite. It bears a resemblance to a skull, or even a front-facing Gaster Blaster. Considering this shows up right before Papyrus draws near, it's possible this was entirely intentional. Monsters Dropping Items Within the code for monster encounters, there's unused lines that suggest that monsters would have been able to drop items upon being killed, with different rarities for items and how many items the monster would drop. It's unknown why this was cut. Okay, so slight heads up before we go into this layer. This layer goes into a lot of theories and pure speculation, and some entries are just jokes, so take everything I say here with a grain of salt. Secret message on Fight Dashboard. Reddit user It's a VG BLT PTA tried digging into the mystery of what the dots and lines mean on the Fight Dashboard, or also known as the screen you see when performing an attack. Obviously, their first thought was to translate this from Morse code, but that didn't go anywhere. However, they had a different idea. What if the lines and dashes are notes to a song? They recreated the notes into a song, and it came out like this. Now, it sounds like meaningless garbage, right? Well, that's where you're wrong. While it's not an exact match, this song has an uncanny resemblance to the song Trouble Dingle. The art book 
book is censored. If you've ever read the art book, you might have noticed something strange. There's not much secret content that's shown off. Sure, there's information about Azrael and Chara included, but not much of the really closed off, hard to get secrets that hardcore fans are familiar with. There's no content related to Gaster, or the things that he may or may not be related to, such as his followers and the stable, for example. There's no information about the memory heads or even Sans related mysteries like the Gaster Blasters and his workshop. What's even weirder is that, for a short time on Fangamer, the description for the art book said that there would be 255 pages, and not the actual count of 225. Was this a simple mistake, or was it a clue that there were removed pages from the art book? Being evil is encouraged. This encouragement isn't exactly direct, but the game does subtly try to push you to try the evil options. Undertale is about the fact that nobody has to die, but because of that, people became interested in the opposite side of the coin, if everybody dies. Characters in the game, especially Sans, consistently tried to discourage you from doing the wrong thing. Which just makes one curious. The best way to describe this is reverse psychology. Characters telling you not to do the wrong thing subtly encourages players who want to do the wrong thing just to see what would happen. Flowey mimics Gaster's face. Tumblr user Skeleton Dumbass Central pointed something out about Flowey. One specific face Flowey mimics has a striking resemblance to Gaster, which implies that Flowey knows what Gaster's face looks like. What's more interesting is that the next frame of his face is this. Does Gaster do this too? Delta ending. Tumblr user Save Load Reset proposes a theory about Undertale and its three main endings. So, remember the prophecy? Let's look at the exact words from the prophecy again. An angel who has seen the surface will come, and the underground will go empty. If we apply this to genocide, this seems to line up. Frisk, Chara, and Azrael have all seen the surface, and at the end you destroy everything, essentially emptying out the underground, right? Well, the symbols of the Deltarune make no sense if the genocide route was the prophecy. Who's the angel? It can't be Chara, they're a demon. And what do the three triangles represent? Well then, how about the true pacifist route? Azriel certainly turns into an angel-like figure, and he absorbs the souls of everyone in the underground, right? Well, about that. Napsabluk wasn't absorbed by Azriel, so the underground didn't truly go empty. And even then, when everyone leaves to go to the surface, Azriel gets left behind. So, is the prophecy bogus then? Is it a red herring? Well, consider this. Undertale has three main endings. Neutral, True Pacifist, and Genocide. Delta is the Greek letter for four. Maybe someday there will be a new ending added to Undertale that truly fulfills the prophecy. He is. In late summer 2017, a new update was issued to Undertale, 1.05a. This update only added two things to the game. The version number changing to 1.05a on the title screen, and some ominous unused text that just says, He is. Hidden lore on backside writing of Toby's notebook. In multiple pictures where Toby showcases doodles in his notebook, the back side of the page can be read, as, you know, it's paper and pens can easily bleed through a bit. It's hard to make out the words, but some things can clearly be read, such as, Dr. Alphys is the creator of the technology, probably a mad scientist, Grandpa Semi fonts. There's a lot of other things that can be read, but they aren't as interesting, but I'll still link the original Tumblr post discussing these notes in the description. This was, I believe, how people initially discovered Grandpa Semi, and deciphered that he was a planned character at one point. It's also interesting that Dr. Alphys was possibly planned as a mad scientist at one point, and she's the creator of some technology. Maybe this is the core, but maybe that's a stretch. Unrevealed Canotines Characters As we know, the Deltarune characters and enemies are based on a deck of cards by Canotines. However, you might have noticed that some of these characters haven't been shown off at all. Let's take a look at them. First off is a big one, the Spade Queen. Much like an actual queen card, she seems to have two heads with a body like Cat Dog. There were some brief mentions of the queen before, so maybe this is her? 
The other queens are never shown in the game, but are on this deck of cards. It seems the Queen of Hearts and the Queen of Diamonds follow the same two-headed design the Queen of Spades does. Meanwhile, the Queen of Clovers has four heads instead. Unlike what you might think, we actually do get to see the King of Hearts, the King of Diamonds, and the King of Clovers in the game. They're all trapped in the prison of Card Castle, and their designs do seem to match. It seems the King of Clovers has five heads as opposed to what we see in the cell. Royal Sciences LLC Royal Sciences LLC is the copyright holder for both Undertale and Deltarune. What a strange name for a company. Happy Town Dictatorship. What if the people of Happy Town, you know, from the unused song, Happy Town, aren't actually happy. They're forced to be happy. Ooh. This is stupid. Sans isn't the weakest enemy. Sans is, in fact, not the weakest enemy in terms of his stats. The real weakest enemy is Ice, which is what Ice Cap turns into after you steal his hat. Ice's attack stat is 1, while his defense stat is 0, below that of Sans. The Red Jester. This is a theory that stems from the fact that Deltarune is inspired by a deck of cards. In a usual deck of cards, there are two jokers, and Jevil is partially black, so he's the black joker, leaving red. Could a red jester be in an upcoming chapter of Deltarune, possibly being another variant of Jevil? Flowey impersonated Asgore when Alphys called about evacuation. One strange detail about Genocide's plot is that Alphys never calls Asgore like Undyne says she would. Why is that? There's no reason for Alphas not to. There's nothing benefiting her for doing so. So is this a plot hole? Well, there's a theory that could patch up this small hiccup. Flowey is very adamant about helping the player during genocide. So what if he impersonated Asgore on the other line of Alphas' call to him? Asgore would have no idea Alphas called him, Alphas would think everything is okay, and Flowey would do something to further benefit the player's murderous needs. I'd say this is a pretty decent theory that gets rid of this minor plot hole. PP variable. Hidden in the files for the sand state is the PP variable. It has absolutely no purpose. Man, we're getting into the real sh spooky shit. Plaid attacks. In the files is some unused dialogue from an NPC that tells you how to dodge orange attacks. That skeleton over there just told me how to dodge orange attacks. What did he say? Something like, traffic lights have three lights on them. The third light, the green one, means go. The first light, the red one, means stop. The second light, the yellow one, means yield. In order to dodge an orange attack, you must be moving. So just think of it this way. Red and yellow lights together make orange. Then you obey the rule of the leftover green light, which means go. Easy, huh? Just think of a red and yellow traffic light, which is actually green. Yeah. Then he started talking about plat attacks. We still have never gotten a fan game that uses plat attacks. So... Get on it, fan game makers! The egg is a parallel to Adam and Eve. The egg in Deltarune is a possible reference to the tale of Adam and Eve, as the events align very well with how you obtain the egg. In the Bible story, a cunning snake offered a forbidden fruit from the Tree of Knowledge to Eve, who accepted it and committed the first human sin. In Deltarune, Chris is offered an egg by a man behind a tree, who is presumably Gaster. A lot of biblical scholars speculate that the snake in the original Adam and Eve story is actually Satan, taking on a different form in order to fool Eve. Well, Gaster does have a lot of ties to the number 666, so maybe the parallels aren't coincidental. Taking the egg back home doesn't change it like all the other items in the game. It still exists in your inventory, showing the forbidden knowledge that the world is all just a game. Even though it is a secret and not accessed by usual means, the egg is a key item. A key item that might prove to be more important by the end of the game. TilbyFox.net slash... Mizuix. This was an old link that led to unfinished or beta versions of songs that Toby created. The directory wasn't meant to be found, and when Toby was questioned about it through email, he said, I don't really care, it's just stuff I share with my friends. This link doesn't work anymore. 
so needless to say, I think Toby cared at least a little bit. Some music from the site has been re-uploaded to YouTube, but I won't play any of it or link it out of respect for Toby. I'm sure he doesn't want people to find songs he never meant people to find. You can search for it if you want, but that's on you to decide. By the way, don't go to the actual link itself, because the site led me to a scam website that I'm pretty sure tried to give me a virus, so don't go to that link just to be safe. Pippin's and King Uprising cutscene. In the cutscene where the Darkeners overthrow the Spade King, there's multiples of an enemy that resembles a diamond. This character is never mentioned anywhere in the game, and it's never even given a name as far as I know. However, there's an unused enemy within the game that could be this very enemy. This cut enemy's name is Pippins. There's not many unused enemies, and almost all of them are previously established characters, so it's highly possible that this unknown enemy is Pippins. Toby Fox makes Siva Gunner rips. Siva Gunner is a channel known for making meme versions of video game OSTs, calling them high quality video game rips. Undertale is the cornerstone of this channel. It is currently the second most ripped game on the channel, with over 400 rips, behind King for Another Day's ridiculous 770 rips. Some submissions to the Siva Gunner channel are entirely anonymous, but a lot of rippers are known. However, what about the ones that aren't known? What I'm saying is, what if Toby Fox made Undertale rips for the channel? There were some rumors that Last Goodbye was by Toby, but this was debunked. It's not off the table, however. If Toby were to do this, the only people who would know would be him and the Siva Gunner team, who would respectfully keep his identity anonymous. Duel Buster There is an unused attack in the game files named Rude Sword, which is identical to Susie's Rude Buster, except it doesn't use magic, so it's a bit weaker. However, in a test fight against Monster 1, if you use this attack, it becomes Duel Buster, which requires both Chris and Susie to use. Undyne is a rock killer. So it's implied through the early parts of Undertale that rocks are sentient in some form. In Snowden, we see a rock that somehow appears and disappears in a scene, Sans has a pet rock, and in the ruins, a rock just straight up talks to you. Later in Waterfall, you come to a room where rocks are falling into a void endlessly, which is weird considering that rocks are alive. So why are they falling here? Well, you find out through a phone call later that Undyne put those rocks there. So it's possible Undyne has a body count consisting of nothing but rocks. www.deltarune.com slash him.png Through archived links on the Wayback Machine, we can find that the page deltarune.com has existed ever since 2015. The entire page is pitch black, but clicking in the top left corner reveals an image titled him.png. It's pitch black just like the website, but brightening it reveals wingdings that translate to three heroes appeared to banish the angels' heaven. Underbound 1 Since Underbound 2 is supposedly the early version of Undertale, what was Underbound 1 like? Nothing. There's no Underbound 1 or Underbound 2. Life is full of sarcasm. And lies. Bloxers parallel the vessel. The Bloxer enemy has a way to spare it that involves lining up its scrambled body parts and rearranging them into a correct pattern. Where else can you scramble body parts? The vessel making sequence. You have three different body parts to change on your vessel, much like how the Bloxer has three scrambled parts. The head, the body, and the legs. Its check information is also interesting. Loves training, hates body being the wrong shape. This is my own personal theory, but perhaps this is hinting at Chris's body being different than the one you made during the vessel making sequence, and their body is the wrong shape to them. Hashtag dysphoria. Undyne had control of the timeline at one point. This is a minor theory by Tumblr user The Irk and Pony, and I'll simply read their post here. In Undertale, it's said that it's been a long time since any human came to the underground, implying that there's been a relatively wide gap between when the sixth soul was collected and when Frisk came to the underground, at least compared to the span of time between the previous souls. 
It's said that whoever has the most determination gains control of the timeline, so the sixth human must have stopped being the most determined at some point. We also know that Flowey was created fairly recently, while Alphys was experimenting with determination. This implies a span of time between the sixth human no longer being the most determined and the creation of Flowey. We also know of one monster able to naturally generate determination. Conclusion. Undyne had control of the timeline at some point. Changed my mind. When Deltarune connects to Undertale when installed, Room Water Redacted will be updated. Okay, fair warning, this is a massive crack theory, so take this with a grain of salt. What if, when you have the full version of Deltarune and the full version of Undertale downloaded onto your computer, they could be linked together in some way? Remember Room Water Redacted? Well, what if Deltarune can be linked to that room and the redacted text gets revealed? This was proposed by Chi Belt himself, and honestly, I can see it happening. When I first played Deltarune, I thought there was a reason as to why Toby said you need to play Undertale first, besides it being a pseudo-sequel. Since Undertale is a massive metagame, I felt like it would use its medium to its advantage more with its sequel, but I'm surprised it didn't. But the idea is fascinating. I would love if Deltarune did this in the future. I don't know if it will, but it'd be a great way to further push its meta-narrative by connecting two game files together. PS4 launch trailer weird vibe. Compared to the other trailers for Undertale, the PS4 trailer plays itself a lot more seriously. In all the other trailers, a goofy song plays in the background and a lot of joke footage is thrown in. However, the PS4 trailer plays itself very straight, with minimal jokes throughout a slow pace and quotes from critics praising the game. And as I said before, the song Shopkeeper is used in the background, which is from Deltarune, which wasn't revealed yet. Chi Seatbelt has a small theory that the reason this trailer is a lot more serious is because Sony wanted to advertise the game that way. Monster Kid's word search came from Deltarune. The Monster Kid's word search is so out of place in Undertale. It's only in one scene and never spoken of again, and it shows a character not shown anywhere else in the game. Well, there might be a reason for that. We see the ICE character in Deltarune, and he's a mascot for a restaurant. Restaurants usually give out word searches to kids while they wait for their food, which explains the name of the Monster Kid's word search. Since ICE is nowhere to be found in Undertale, the only possible way Sans could have gotten this word search is from the restaurant in Deltarune. And it's not like they're particularly far from each other either. Loneliness feeling. In an interview with Indie World, Toby had this to say. I was going to make the cell phone a character who would be able to talk to the player. However, I felt the loneliness of the game was damaged because of it. This is a topic about Undertale that's not discussed as much. The game is very lonely. Yes, it sounds stupid when you consider the countless characters you encounter that try to befriend you, but also, none of them are your friends at first, and you are the only human in the underground. And your friends aren't with you throughout the entire game. Remember the unfamiliarity with the ruins? Remember the long treks through Waterfall's quiet visuals? Remember the walk to New Home and the elevator ride there? Remember the boat ride with the river person? Remember all of the moments you were truly alone? That was a majority of the game. You leave everyone you encounter behind, too. You leave Toriel with a teary hug goodbye. You leave Papyrus behind after a date. You run away from Undyne. You abandon Alphys after she spills the ugly truth to you. And even when you're with Asgore, it's just you and him at the end of the underground, having to do something that neither of you want to do. This feeling is even further exemplified during the genocide route. You're the lone human, killing everything in sight as monsters evacuate in fear, and at the end, you destroy the entire world, leaving nothing but the wind to accompany. Chris Me Costume Leak In December 2019, an anonymous 4chaner posted this to a board. Chris from Deltarune Me Costume. The Knight from Hollow Knight Me Costume. Fire Emblem Three Houses DLC Pack. Included with it, Me Costumes, Spirits, and a Stage. There is no fighter. Screen cap this. Obviously, this never came to fruition, but later the same leaker correctly listed Byleth as a character and their alternate costumes, so maybe there's some validity to his claim of Chris as a me fighter. It's now speculated that this was from a list of considered me costumes and not a list of me costumes that were actually coming to the game. 
The save point is the true original Star Walker. The Star Walker guy you meet in Scarlet Forest looks remarkably like the save point you see in Undertale. So the save point is the actual true original Star Walker that came before this other Star Walker faker. Voiced headcanon's hive mind. Okay, well, there's no real hive mind involved, but a lot of people's headcanons for the characters' voices are nearly identical. The most major example is Sans Papyrus. Most people go for a deep Patrick-like voice for Sans, and a high Skeletor-like voice for Papyrus, and when that's not the case, it sounds... wrong. Hell, even when I played this game for the first time, those are the exact same voices I imagined for them. This is probably because the characters' personalities and text box sounds shape a specific sound in your mind that usually ends up being the same with everyone else's headcanons. Other Halloween hack songs in future Deltarune chapters. We all know about how Megalovania got ascended from a ROM hack to being in an official Nintendo product, but consider the idea that other songs from the Halloween hack could be reused for other parts of Deltarune. Parts of the hack are being repurposed already, such as Chris's appearance, so it wouldn't be a stretch to say more songs could be lifted from that game for Deltarune. Here's an example. Wouldn't something like the id fit perfectly in a dreadful, atmospheric segment? Soul Knife. Some unused names for items in Undertale's demo were found in the comments of the code, and one of them sticks out. The Toy Knife was originally named the Soul Knife. This is incredibly obscure, and no one has even talked about what this could mean. It's possible the Soul Knife was a real knife that you could equip, but it was changed to a Toy Knife to keep the tone for the ruins more lighthearted. Other unused items include Butter Knives and Ancient Toffee. What those two thought. In entry number 17, when Gaster asked, What do you two think? What did they really think? Yes, it sounds stupid, and yes, this is kind of a joke entry, but this answer will change depending on whoever the hell those two actually are. What did they have to say about his experiment? Did they help with it? Who knows by this point. Undiscovered Xbox One Secrets the Xbox One version of Undertale hasn't been data mined yet as of making this video. There hasn't been any reports of Gaster in the Xbox One version yet either, and the Nobody Connected secret took some time to figure out. So it's possible there's more within Undertale's Xbox files just waiting to be found. Toby's website on the Wayback Machine is blacklisted. Toby Fox's old website, radiation.fobby.net slash Halloween, used to have several archives on the Wayback Machine, but that's not the case anymore. It's possible Toby himself requested to remove these archivals because it consisted of posts made by his old teenage self. The Undertale website is the same way. There's a massive gap between May 7th, 2013 and June 23rd, 2013 in terms of captures, meaning older versions of the demo are long gone and unable to be verified. It's possible this is the case because nobody knew what the hell an Undertale was in 2013 and didn't think to archive it. However, it's possible Toby had some influence in that. Why do I think that? Well... Lost Demo Removed Content Tumblr user SaveLoadReset claims that these sprites of Chara were data mined from incredibly early versions of Undertale's demo, but this can't be verified. Tumblr user Doge with a Bloge discovered the Wayback Machine's blacklisting that I mentioned before, and realized that any possible demo that had these sprites in them are entirely lost to time. And perhaps Toby wants to keep it that way. Deltarune is a retelling of the Halloween hack. This entry was meant to be talked about way earlier on this layer, but I wanted to save this one for last because the ideas around this entry are very touching to me, and they just make me really emotional thinking about it. This theory is proposed by Tumblr user ZombieKaiba, and I'll be quoting from their post from time to time. So let's start off by talking about the Halloween hack itself. Yes, it has a reputation for being Toby's edgy ROM hack that dropped the EP slur and dumb swears, 
but it's still important to know that this was still something that had deeper themes than you realize, even if they weren't executed that well. For example, this ROM hack tried to go into the idea of if video game monsters truly deserve to die or not. Sound familiar? The ROM hack also tries to delve into horror elements, but they're... not that good. However, seeing the True Lab segment in Undertale and Deltarune's ending, it's quite clear that Toby wants to revisit what he failed to do in the Halloween hack with these new visions of horror. The hack also has a theme that sounds very familiar. I'll quote Toby here. The main theme of this game is the lack of choice. There is really no choice in this game. From the moment you start to the moment you finish, you're destined to kill Dr. Antonuts. There are two endings, but they both eventually end up the same way. It's all a big joke on the player. You know why there isn't a choice there? Because you already chose to make Varric go into that door. You already chose to go forward. The only real choice, as Varric realizes at the end of the game, is to stop or keep going. By stop, he means turn off the game, and that's all you can do. Anything you play is your own fault for playing, and that's the only real choice you can make. Now, what I didn't know about this hack before reading this post is that it genuinely tried to tackle LGBT themes. Dr. Andonuts is a repressed gay man. He destroys his own life trying to repress his homosexuality. In contrast, Undertale takes a much more lighthearted approach to LGBT themes. The underground is a utopia with no homophobia or transphobia. People respect Frisk and Char's pronouns. Alpha and Undyne are a couple with no shame in their sexuality. And Ma Mad Mew Mew and Metaton literally transition. However, a few small details in Deltarune appear to be steering this more positive world in a different direction. I'll quote Zombie Kaiba here. Some of the hints in the Deltarune demo, however, the Toriel has become Catholic thing, the fact that Alphas and Undyne haven't met, and Metaton hasn't been able to transition, the potential trans implications of choosing a name only to have it discarded for an assigned one, you can't choose who you are in this world, make me suspect that's one of the themes that Toby will try to revisit from an adult perspective. Zombie Kaiba also briefly touches on the fact that the Halloween hack narrator is seemingly a different character than the protagonist, with the narrator reacting to what you do. Chara narrator, anybody? The Halloween hack also tries to work with the concept of you being a puppet master to an unwilling puppet. I've talked about this tons of times before, with the player being an important part of the story, with their actions being theirs and not the main characters. Toby had this to say about it. As you approach someone you've never met that you're labeling as a monster, your body pushes you forward to kill him. What's funny is that it's not even uncontrolled. It's really just the force of the player's controller pushing that little bounty hunter into murdering Andonuts. You might not realize it, but Varric is almost dead, and yet he can't stop moving because you keep pushing those buttons. And finally, the last idea of the Halloween hack. The game is fundamentally an experience based on nostalgia. Toby grew up with Earthbound. He said that Earthbound dominated his childhood, shaped his preteen years, and played a large role into molding him into the pseudo-offbeat hippie he is today. It gave him a sense of humor. It helped him learn how to read. Its lessons served as a basis for a sense of justice and courage. So when making the Halloween hack, he made it out of nostalgia to get more out of a game that had grown stale to his 16-year-old self. At one point in the ROM hack, you enter a dreamlike version of Onnit, with a lot of past experiences playing from the first Earthbound game, and all the enemies you encounter are named, remember me? They recognize Varric as Ness, or do they recognize you as the player who played Earthbound all those years ago? If Toby wants to revisit this idea of using nostalgia as a basis for Deltarune, that's going to be hard. He can't exactly do that with, like, Earthbound, can he? Well. Toby made a game that's far more popular than Earthbound. He made Undertale. He gave memories and nostalgia to millions of people. He can take this game and reshape it, just like he did with Earthbound. He wants you to be familiar with Undertale, so he can take the pieces, reshape them, and create Deltarune. Hey. I just want to say, if you made it to the end of this video, 
thank you very much for watching. This video has been a pain in my ass. Oh, it's, it's, it's taken so long to actually finish this whole damn thing, and I am shocked I managed to finish it right before Deltarune Chapter 2 comes out. I, I seriously can't believe that it got announced in the middle of making this video. Like, what are the chances? What are the chances that Toby just knows I'm going to make a video like this and just decide to just outdate me the minute the video comes out? <laughs> oh, goodness. So, yeah, just thank you for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. I think this was a much better video than my first one. Uh, hopefully, I'll make more Iceberg content in the future. Maybe I'll do some other stuff. Uh, I hope you stick around. I'm going to be try to stream Deltarune later on today, like ch chapter two, I mean, and I hope you, I hope you come around for that. <laughs> it's not open right now, but I am considering opening up a Patreon in the future, so look out for that. And overall, just thank you again. <laughs> this is very imp improv, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> So yeah, I hope you have a great day, I hope Deltarune Chapter 2 is fucking amazing, and hope to catch you soon. Bye.